Chapter 46 Captain Peter Quayle occupied a pretty little brick row house on Camden Hill Road, with a shiny black-painted front door, and a small garden filled with a profusion of late-blooming roses. As Sebastian reined in his chestnuts beside the gate, a delicate-looking young woman with a basket looped over one arm, and a pair of secateurs in her hand, looked up from deadheading a large shrub near the fence. Sebastian handed the reins to Tom. Walk them. The woman appeared to be in her mid-twenties, with a finely featured face and soft blonde curls that tumbled from beneath a straw bonnet tied at her chin with a cherry-red ribbon. She wore a lightweight cherry-red spencer over a simple sprigged muslin morning gown, and watched Sebastian's approach with the wary eyes of a woman whose fragile world has already been rocked too many times by the unpredictable activities of her erratic husband. Mrs. Quayle, Sebastian asked, politely removing his hat as he opened the low front gate. Yes. He gave her a reassuring smile. I'm Lord Devlin. I served in the same regiment as your husband in Portugal. Perhaps you've heard him speak of me. The wariness in her pale blue eyes receded, and she smiled. I have heard Peter mention you, yes. How do you do, my lord? What brings you here? Sebastian let his gaze drift over the house's curtained windows. Is the captain at home? Mrs. Quayle closed her sacateurs and laid them in the basket of roses. Why, yes, if you'd like to— The front door jerked open to slam against the inside wall with a bang. Captain Quayle clattered out onto the small porch and down the steps to advance on them with a quick, long-legged stride. He was only half-dressed, the tails of his shirt untucked, the neck half-open to reveal a triangle of bare chest. "'What have you told him?' he demanded, his handsome jaw clenched, his eyes hard on his wife's face. She took a step back. "'Nothing. Lord Devlin just—' "'Get inside,' he ordered his good arm swinging through the air to point back at the house. Her face drained pale, then flushed scarlet. She threw Sebastian a quick, mortified glance, then looked away. Excuse me, my lord? Sebastian watched her hurry toward the house, her head bent, and felt his hands curl into fists at his side. What are you doing at my house? Sebastian brought his gaze back to Quayle's handsome face, with its rugged chin and clear blue eyes and aquiline nose. You lied to me. You told me you didn't know Barclay Carmichael, when in fact he won five hundred pounds off you shortly before he was killed. The captain's jaw tightened. Get off my property, now! With deliberate slowness, Sebastian settled his hat back on his head and turned toward the gate. You might warn your wife to expect the constables soon. Constables? Quayle stood in the center of his yard, his empty shirt sleeve flapping in the cool breeze. Why? I had nothing to do with that man's death, I tell you. He was killed by the West End butcher. Sebastian paused with one hand on the gate. You didn't by any chance have a younger brother, did you? A brother who served as cabin boy on a merchant ship? Quayle's eyes narrowed. No. What are you talking about? The harmony. Never heard of it. Sebastian studied the man's closed, hard face and found only confusion and anger. He turned away. You don't think it's him, do you? said Tom, scrambling back up onto his perch as Sebastian took the reins. Sebastian gave his horses the office to start. Unfortunately, no which means that however much I'd like to kill him, I can't. Cat was peering through the bowed window of a perfumery on Bond Street when she heard a man's cheery voice say, Top of the morning to you, my lady. She swung to find Aidan O'Connell smiling at her with lazy green eyes. Now you come, she said. His smile widened to bring a beguiling dimple to one cheek. I had to leave town unexpectedly for a few days. He captured her hand and brought it to his lips in a parody of gallantry. Forgive me? 
She took her hand back. No. He laughed. Why did you want to see me? He fell into step beside her as she turned to walk up the street, her sunshade held at a crisp angle. Actually, I was going to suggest you might want to leave the country. Really? He kept the smile in place, but his gaze sharpened. Why? Someone was about to betray you to Lord Jarvis. The dimple faded. Oh? Cat twirled her parasol. Jarvis gave me a choice. Your identity or my life. And so you betrayed me. As it happens, no. Lord Jarvis's threat to me became known, and it was suggested his own health might suffer as a consequence. Ah, I think I understand. I saw the notice of your approaching nuptials in this morning's paper. Congratulations. Thank you. But your congratulations are premature. She swung to face him. I want your help leaving the country. He opened his eyes wide. Really? And your marriage to Lord Devlin? Would ruin him? The Irishman was silent for a moment. Then he said, You love him that much, that you would go away to save him from himself? Yes. Turning, she continued up the street. It's to your advantage to help me leave. You know that. Without Devlin's protection, I would remain vulnerable to Jarvis. Why do you need my help? Ships leave England from any number of ports every day. Because Jarvis's men may still be watching the ports? I can't take that chance, and neither can you. I don't have much time, she added impatiently when he said nothing. A wedding is scheduled for Monday night. O'Connell continued studying her in silence for a moment, then let out his breath in a strange sound that could have meant anything. I'll see what I can do. Chapter 47 The children were playing in the square across from the house. The boy looked about twelve, toe-headed with ruddy cheeks, and limbs just beginning to lengthen beyond boyhood. The girl was some four or five years younger, and still very much a child, with a ragged, beloved doll she kept tucked under one arm as she ran, laughing after her brother. Sebastian stood and watched them for a time, then turned to mount the steps to Felix Atkinson's house in Portland Place. He found Atkinson still at home and finishing his coffee in the morning room. He looked surprised and vaguely annoyed to have Sebastian's card brought up to him. Please have a seat, Lord Devlin, he said curtly, although I must warn you, I haven't much time. Or what may I do for you? Sebastian took one of the chairs near the cold hearth and said in a pleasant voice, I understand you were a passenger on the Harmony's return voyage from India some five years ago. Atkinson set aside his cup with a shaky hand. Yes, that's right. He was a prim-looking man of medium height and build, in his late thirties now, perhaps a little older. He wore his light brown hair oiled and swept to one side in a futile attempt to disguise a receding hairline, and he had a habit of putting up one hand to touch it, as if to reassure himself it was still in place. You've noticed, I assume, said Sebastian, that someone seems to be killing the sons of your fellow passengers. Atkinson's hand crept up to touch his hair, then slipped away. Well, you don't mince words, do you, my lord? To answer your question, yes, I have noticed. Perhaps you noticed on your way into the house that I have at least two Bow Street runners watching my children at all times. He pushed to his feet. I appreciate your concern for my family's welfare, even if I fail to understand what affair any of this might be of yours. However, I'm a busy man, Lord Devlin, so I really must ask you to excuse. Sit down, said Sebastian, his voice no longer pleasant. Atkinson sank back to the edge of his chair. It must have been a living hell on that ship after the crew left, taking with them most of the food and water, Sebastian leaned forward. I imagine you thought you'd never see your family again. Atkinson cleared his throat and looked away. It was difficult, yes. But we were all Englishmen and women, 
thank God. I would have expected the water to run out before the food. So we feared. The crew left us but one barrel of water, you know. But one of the gentlemen aboard, Sir Humphrey to be precise, rigged up a kind of distillery using a tea kettle and a gun barrel. It didn't produce much, but it was enough to keep us alive. That was when the lack of food became the major issue. Most of the ship's stores had been lost in the storm, and the crew took what was left. Tell me about the cabin boy, said Sebastian, his gaze on the other man's face. A tick began to pull at the edge of Atkinson's mouth. The cabin boy? What was his name again? Gideon? I think so. Yes. Do you by any chance remember his family name? The twitch became more rapid, distorting the lower part of the man's face. I don't know that I ever heard it. Why? He was injured, was he not? In the storm. Yes. Sebastian leaned forward. I wonder, how long after the crew left, did he die? Atkinson leapt from his seat and began to pace the room. I don't know. I can't recall. It was a very difficult time. Sebastian watched the man striding back and forth. I suppose you've heard the rumours. Atkinson stood very still, his entire face now twitching with distress. Rumours? What rumours? It was inevitable, I suppose, given the way the bodies of the victims have been butchered. I mean, a shipload of starving passengers and a dying boy. Sebastian shrugged. You can imagine the conclusions people are drawing. They're lies! Atkinson's voice rose to a shrill pitch. All lies! It never happened! He brought up a handkerchief to press against his lips. Do you hear me? It never happened! Sebastian stretched to his feet. Unfortunately, someone out there obviously believes it did happen. And unless you help us catch him, that boy of yours playing in the square will continue to be at risk. How can I help you catch this killer when I don't know who he is? You think if I knew I wouldn't tell you? Sebastian let his gaze drift toward the window overlooking the square. In the sudden silence, the laughter of the children came to them, light and sweet. If there's one thing the last few days have taught me, said Sebastian, it's that some men will do anything, sacrifice anything and anyone, to save their own lives. He turned toward the door. Good day, Mr. Atkinson. Do give my best to your family. Chapter 48 Aidan O'Connell trolled the pleasure haunts of the Haute Monde, looking for a tall man with long black hair and the wink of a pirate's gold in one ear. He found Russell Yates at Gentleman Jackson's in Bond Street. For a moment, Aidan simply stood on the sidelines, watching the ex-privateer spar with the champion himself. Yeats was an enigma, a born gentleman with a comfortable fortune, who amused himself by running rum and the odd French agent beneath the noses of His Majesty's Navy. Some did it for money, and some did it out of a fierce conviction. Yeats did it for fun. Aidan waited to approach him until the other man had left the ring, a towel draped around his neck. I need to talk to you, said Aidan quietly. Yates scrubbed the towel across his sweaty face, his eyes alert and gleaming with interest. What is it? Aidan leaned in close to drop his voice. A mutual acquaintance of ours needs to go away. Cat was organising papers at her desk when Russell Yates sent up his card. For the sake of Sebastian's investigation, she checked her first impulse, which was to have the ship owner told she was not at home. This is unexpected, Mr. Yates, she said, rising to greet him when Elspeth showed him up. Please, have a seat. Have you recalled something of relevance concerning the harmony? Yates stretched out in one of the chairs beside the fireplace, a large, powerfully built man who exuded virility and a rakish air of danger. Actually, I'm here because of an interesting conversation I had with Aidan O'Connell this morning. 
He tells me you've decided to travel abroad. Permanently. Cat raised one eyebrow. Now, why would he tell you a thing like that? Mr. O'Connell and I have made these sorts of arrangements before. I see. Cat came to sink into the chair opposite him. And can you arrange it? Before tomorrow night? I assume you wish to go to France rather than to the Americas. The Americas are so dreadfully, well, colonial. Still. Something about the mindset, I suppose. France would be fine, Cat said in a tight voice. She knew it should matter to her where she went, but somehow it did not. She found the thought of life without Devlin anywhere too unbearable to contemplate for long enough to come up with a coherent plan beyond removing herself from the temptation of saying yes to everything he was urging. I have a sloop leaving Dover with tomorrow's tide. It can have you in Calais in four hours. Cat felt an ache pull across her chest. It was one thing to reach the decision to leave, but something else entirely to actually make the arrangements. Good, she said briskly, pushing up from the chair and reaching for the bell to summon Elspeth. Now you'll have to excuse me. I have much to prepare. O'Connell also told me something of why you're leaving, said Yates. She swung slowly to face him again. I saw Lord Devlin's announcement in this morning's post. There aren't many actresses who would abandon everything they know, home, career, friends, to save the man they love from ruining himself. You're a remarkable woman. I wouldn't say so. No, I don't suppose you would. He rested his elbows on the delicate arms of the chair, his fingers templed before him. Right now you believe you have only three alternatives. You can take your chances with Lord Jarvis. Never a good idea. You can ruin Viscount Devlin by marrying him. Or you can flee the country. But there is a fourth option. She gave a short, humorless laugh. There is. We could help each other. She cocked her head. How could I help you? You've heard the whispers about me, no doubt. He smiled when she hesitated. Don't be shy. The rumours have been circulating for years. The tales of my exploits on the briny seas diminished them for a time, but only for a time. Lately, the gossip has become both more vicious and more troublesome. People are watching me. I fear the moral climate of our age is becoming more oppressive. Have you noticed? The inclination of which you speak has never been condoned. Not in our culture. How true. One can gamble away a fortune, drink oneself to death, openly set up half a dozen mistresses, or regularly debauch young virgins fresh from the countryside, and no one in society will give it a second thought. But direct your love toward a member of the wrong sex, and the punishment is not mere social ostracism, but death. A death as ugly and unpleasant as that which Jarvis promises you. Cat studied the man's dark, square-jawed face. You have enemies who would wish to see you destroyed? One. One very powerful enemy. He dares not move against me directly. But it is not so difficult to manipulate rumour and public opinion. Cat came to sink back into the chair opposite him. It's Jarvis, isn't it? As a matter of fact, yes. I don't understand. Why would Jarvis dare not move against you directly? Because it just so happens that Lord Jarvis is hiding a dangerous secret. A secret that, if it were to become known, would destroy his influence at the palace and very likely lead to his own death. You have proof of this? If I did not, I would be dead. Jarvis knows my death will lead to the publication of what he most desires to be kept undisclosed. Hence his caution. I would think that such a threat from you would be sufficient to motivate his lordship to suppress any rumours about you, not foment them. You might think so. But there's a flaw in that logic. 
If I were to move to bring down Lord Jarvis, he would retaliate by having me killed. We would effectively destroy each other. So what does any of this have to do with me? It occurs to me that the easiest and quickest way to lay the rumours to rest would be for me to take a wife. A famous wife, known for her beauty, sensuality, and charisma. Cat laughed. You can't be serious. I am utterly serious. It would be a mutually beneficial arrangement. I would protect you from Jarvis, while you would provide me with what I suppose one could call a disguise. With Cat Boleyn as my wife, anyone questioning my virility or sexuality would be laughed out of the room. Why me? Why not choose a bride from the selection available at Almax? He smiled. This isn't the kind of arrangement I'd care to explain to some innocent debutante just out of the schoolroom. You need have no worry I would press to consummate the marriage. I offer you companionship and witty conversation at the supper table. But our amorous adventures, obviously, would be directed elsewhere. All I ask is that you pursue them with discretion. As shall I. Cat pushed up from her chair to pace the room. She should have dismissed the suggestion out of hand. Instead, she found herself saying, Devlin would never forgive me were I to embark on such a marriage. You think he would forgive you for running away to France? When Cat said nothing, he added, I can have a marriage contract drawn up preserving your control over whatever wealth you bring to the marriage, as well as your subsequent earnings. No! This is impossible. Don't dismiss the idea too hastily. Give it some thought. She brought up one hand to rub absently at her temples. This proof you claim to possess against Jarvis, how do I know it exists? He smiled. I expected you to be suspicious. Slipping his hand into his coat, he drew forth a case of soft brown leather tied with a thong. So I brought it. The documents in the case were thorough, damning, and irrefutably authentic. Good God, whispered Cat when she had finished reading through them. Exactly. Yates tucked the documents away and rose to his feet to cast a significant glance around the elegantly proportioned room with its peach silk hangings and theatrical memorabilia. You don't need to give all this up. What you are suggesting is outrageous. He shrugged. Think about it. Cat stayed where she was, her hands gripped tightly together in front of her. At the door, he paused to look back, his pirate's earring winking in the sunlight streaming in through the front windows. Oh, I almost forgot. The name of the Harmony's cabin boy you were asking about? It was Forbes. Gideon Forbes. After Yates left, Cat paid a boy a shilling to carry a brief note to Brook Street, giving Sebastian the dead cabin boy's name. Then she thought about sending Elsworth up to the attic to pull down her trunks. Instead, she stood at the front window, looking out at Harwich Street, and the familiar crowded rooftops, chimneys, and soot-stained spires of the city she had called home for more than ten years. Chapter 49 Later that afternoon, Sebastian drew up the curricle on the gravel sweep before a small Elizabethan sandstone manor. Lying to the north of London, near St. Albans, the childhood home of Gideon Forbes proved to be a pleasant, well-kept estate with fat-bellied cows and well-tended fields. As he swung down from the curricle, Sebastian could hear the sound of children's laughter mingling with the barking of a dog in the distance. It's funny, said Tom, squinting up at the manor's forest of chimneys. But when you think about what must have happened to that lad, somehow you don't expect him to have grown up someplace that looks so ordinary. I know what you mean, said Sebastian. Acting on Cat's message, he had found it easy enough to trace Gideon Forbes here, to this idyllic corner of the Hertfordshire countryside. 
Gideon's father was a country squire named Brandon Forbes. The boy's mother was some four years dead, but whatever Sebastian had been anticipating, it wasn't this, this utterly English landscape of unpretentious gentility and bucolic peace. A shout brought Sebastian's head around. A sturdily built man in serviceable buckskin breeches was walking toward the house from across a park of oak trees and sun-spangled grass that waved gently in the breeze. He looked to be in his mid-forties, his dark hair newly touched by grey, the lines on his long face just beginning to settle and deepen with age. A liver-coloured hound loped at his heels. May I help you? he called. Sebastian went to meet him. Mr. Forbes, I'm Viscount Devlin. I'd like to talk to you about your son, Gideon. The man blinked several times, his eyes narrow and a bit wary. All right, he said at last. Come walk with me. They followed a footpath that curled away toward a distant string of cottages, the hound racing ahead of them. It's because of these terrible murders, isn't it? he said after a moment. That's why you're here. You think there's some connection to the wreck of the Harmony? Sebastian studied the man's sun-darkened face. Did you attend the trial of the mutineers? No. Forbes stared off across the fields to where two little girls played with a much younger boy still in leading strings. I'm afraid Gideon's mother was sickening by then. She'd never been well after the birth of our last daughter, you see, and I didn't want to leave her. But I followed it in the papers. Did you go to the hangings? Forbes shook his head, his lips twisting in a grimace. Nah, what would be the point? Revenge, perhaps? It wouldn't bring the boy back now, would it? Sebastian nodded toward the laughing children in the distance. Are they yours? Forbes' features lightened into a proud smile. That's right. Catherine there is eleven. Jane is seven, while Michael has just turned two. And of two older boys by my first wife. Roland, who helps me here at the manor, and his younger brother, Daniel. Daniel's up at Cambridge. As Sebastian watched, the boy on the leading strings took a tumble and started to cry. His half-sisters rushed to pick him up again. You've remarried? Aye. He sighed. I've buried two wives, God rest their souls. I pray to the good Lord I won't bury the third. Sebastian brought his gaze back to the man's plain, long face. Do you think these murders have something to do with the harmony? Looks that way, doesn't it? I mean, I didn't think much about it after Carmichael's and Stanton's sons were killed. But now, with Captain Bellamy's son, and what the papers are saying was done to young Thornton last Easter, he hesitated. Well, it makes you think, doesn't it? Did you ever talk to Captain Bellamy about what happened to your son? Aye. Bellamy came to see me when it was all over. Brought me this. He pulled a worn Spanish piece of eight from his pocket and held it out. It was Gideon's. He'd had it from the time he was a little one. Carried it with him everywhere. Did he tell you how the boy died? Spar fell on him during the storm. He didn't die right away, though. Gideon was a plucky one, no doubt about it. Maybe if they'd been rescued sooner, he'd have made it. But without food or water? The man's voice trailed away. He hesitated, then blew out his breath in a long sigh. I never should have let him go to sea. Not that young. But from the time he was a little tyke, it was all he could talk about the sea and tall ships and all the foreign lands he wanted to visit. In the end, he wore us down. One of his mother's cousins knew Captain Bellamy and arranged to have him take the lad on as cabin boy. Gideon was aiming to be a sea captain, you know. He'd have made it, too, if he'd lived. Sebastian studied the man's pleasant, weathered face. The young men who've been killed have all been found with various objects stuffed in their mouths. A papier-mâché star, a mandrake root, a page torn from a ship's log, and the hoof of a goat. Do you have any idea what it could mean? 
As Sebastian watched, Forbes' face became tight with an effort to control his emotions. I didn't read anything about that. It does mean something, doesn't it? What is it? Forbes swung away to stare out over the park toward the laughing children. Gideon had a poem he liked. You know the one? Something about mermaids singing? Go and catch a falling star, said Sebastian softly. By John Dunn. Forbes' throat worked as he swallowed. That's it. Go and catch a falling star. He brought his gaze back to Sebastian's face. Bellamy told me they buried Gideon's body at sea. But that's not what you think happened to him, is it? Is it? he said again, when Sebastian remained silent. Sebastian met the other man's intense grey eyes. No. No, I don't. Chapter 50 Cat was drinking tea on the terrace at the rear of her house, overlooking the tree-shaded garden, when her maid came hurrying across the pavement. I asked her to wait in the drawing room while I announced her, said Elspeth, wringing her work-worn hands against her apron. Truly I did, but she said... Cat cut her off. Who, Elspeth? A woman's voice reached her, low and stern. Good morning, niece. Cat stared across the sun-dappled terrace at the thin matron who stood in the open doorway. It had been more than ten years since Cat had stolen away from this woman's home. A frightened, desperate child, willing to face the uncertainties of life on the streets, rather than continue to endure this woman's grim whippings by day, and the degrading violations that came in the terrifying darkness of the night. Her name was Emma Stone, and she was a close associate of Holy Hannah Moore and William Wilberforce, and the growing group of moral reformers known as the Evangelicals. Emma Stone had made the Evangelical Society for the Suppression of Vice and Immorality her own special project, perhaps as a public form of atonement for the shame of having a sister as scandalously immoral as Cat's mother. They had come to London together, Emma and Arabella Noland, two Irish sisters, pretty but poorly dowered. The elder, Emma, had married a barrister named Morris Stone. Arabella, the younger and prettier, had chosen a different path, becoming the mistress of first one wealthy nobleman, then the next. You are not welcome in my house, aunt, said Cat, keeping her voice level with effort. Believe me. It is only my sense of duty to my dead mother and the laws of our dear Lord that have brought me here. Cat gave her aunt a cold, tight smile. Your devotion to your Lord's laws seems very selective. She cast a deliberate eye over her aunt's unrelieved morning gown of black bombazine. Is he dead, then? Mr. Stone has been gone from me these past three years. And still you wear deep mourning for him? How... Cat paused, searching for the right word. Hypocritical of you. Two bright spots of colour appeared on the other woman's cheeks. I did not believe the lies you told ten years ago. I'm not about to believe them now. No. Of course not. Cat crossed her arms before her. I assume you're here for some reason. Please state what it is and go away. The colour in Emma Stone's cheeks deepened. I should have expected such a reception. There aren't many women in my position who would have taken you in when I did, the illegitimate offspring of a harlot, and the man who had her in his keeping. And how did you repay me? By fleeing my protection without a word of warning or thanks? I'm the oddest creature, said Cat in a tight voice. I decided... If I was going to be forced to slake a man's lust, then I might as well get paid for it. A tremble of raw fury shook Emma Stone's thin frame. Cat expected her to launch into an impassioned defence of her dead husband, or simply go away. Instead, she clenched her jaw so tightly she was practically spitting out her words. 
I am here because of the notice of your approaching nuptials in the morning post. Really, aunt? You shock me. I had no idea you interested yourself in the affairs of society. I do not, which is why I remained unaware of your relationship with Lord Devlin until the betrothal was brought to my attention by my dear friend Mrs. Barnes. You recall Mrs. Barnes? Cat remained motionless. Eunice Barnes was both her mother's near neighbour and a fellow soldier in the Society for the Suppression of Vice. She is the only one of my acquaintances who realised that the brazen hussy calling herself Cat Bullin and flaunting herself on the boards at Covent Garden was none other than the niece I had once sheltered. And she kept such delicious gossip to herself? I am impressed. Mrs. Stone acknowledged the barb with a twitching of her upper lip. Had I been aware of the nature of the relationship you had developed with Viscount Devlin, I would, of course, have overcome my repugnance and approached you sooner. Your repugnance? Yes. I suppose it must be quite a soul-trying exercise for a saintly woman such as yourself to venture into this den of sin and debauchery. You'd best say what you came to say and run away quickly before you become contaminated. Mrs. Stone jerked open the strings of her reticule to draw forth two small miniatures painted on oval porcelain plaques and framed in gold filigree. Your mother stayed with me for a short time before she fled London. Did you know? Cat kept her surprise to herself, although in truth she had not known. Had Emma Stone's despicable husband made his vile advances on Cat's mother, too? Cat wondered. Had he found a grown woman, even one heavy with child, better able to defend herself than a thirteen-year-old girl? The ungrateful wretch fled my house as you did, leaving only a curt note of thanks, and these two miniatures, which he begged me to accept as payment. And you didn't sell them? However much Emma Stone might prate on about the kingdom of heaven, Cat knew the woman still maintained a healthy interest in the material comforts of this world. Mrs. Stone's head reared back in exaggerated affront. Do you think I would take payment for sheltering my own sister in her time of need? The good book says, Jesus, our Lord, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Cat kept her gaze on her aunt's lined face. The passage of time had not been kind to Emma Stone, crimping the skin around her mouth and etching her habitually disapproving expression deep. I assume there is a point to all of this, aunt. Emma Stone held out the first miniature. This one is of your mother. I assume you recognize her. Cat cradled the porcelain oval in her hands, the painting so exquisitely rendered that it caught her breath. It was a face Cat hadn't seen in more than ten years. The wide green eyes slanted up slightly at the ends like a cat's the cheekbones high and flaring, the nose almost childlike above full, sensuous lips. Cat could trace some of those features in her own face, mingling with traits she'd come to think of as purely her own, although she knew they must have come from the unknown lord who'd been her father. She skimmed her fingers across the smooth surface, as if by touching the painted likeness she might somehow touch the laughing, breathing mother who'd once loved her. A welling of emotion closed her throat. It was a moment before she could look up and say, And the other miniature? Emma Stone pressed her lips together in grim censure. The other miniature is the reason I have come. It is of the last man who had my sister in his keeping. Your father. With a hand that was not quite steady, Cat reached to take the small painting held out to her. Somehow, even before her hand closed over the miniature, she knew what she would see. He was younger, of course, at least twenty-four years younger, 
The deftly rendered hair was still dark, the features solid but still firm. She had his chin, Cat realized. She supposed it was understandable that she had never noticed it before. But she should have recognized the eyes, she thought. How could she never have realized that the vivid blue eyes that stared back at her from her own reflection were those of Alistair Sincere, the Earl of Hendon? Chapter 51 once I give this information to Bow Street, said Sir Henry Lovejoy, I have little doubt but what they'll move to arrest Mr. Forbes. Henry focused his gaze on Lord Devlin. Do you think he's guilty? They sat in the modest drawing room of Henry's Russell Square house, the remnants of tea spread on the table before them. Shifting in his chair, the Viscount stretched out his legs and crossed them at the ankles. Forbes seems the most likely suspect, obviously, but is he guilty? I honestly don't think so. The pieces of the puzzle are all fitting neatly together, but the picture they make seems somehow off-kilter. I can't explain why. He's the only one with a motive that I can see. There's no doubt it's a powerful motive, Devlin agreed. Knowing your son was killed and eaten by a shipload of starving men and women. Did they kill the boy, do you think? He might simply have died. He was injured, after all, without adequate food or water. He could have died of his injuries. But there have been other instances in which starving Englishmen and women have been reduced to feeding upon their dead companions or have drawn lots. The fact that this company kept quiet about what they did suggests the boy was simply killed out of hand. He blew out a long breath. I doubt we'll ever know the truth. No, you're probably right, Henry sighed. I'll take this information to Sir James at Bow Street tonight. Devlin fixed him with an uncomfortably fierce yellow stare. I suppose you must, but... He broke off. Henry raised one eyebrow. You think there's something you've missed? I don't know. I wish I understood better the part Jarvis's son played in all this. There's no evidence that Matt Parker's brother spoke the truth. Who would take the word of a hanged sailor against the testimony of the likes of Sir Humphrey Carmichael or Lord Stanton? The Viscount set his teacup aside and stood up. In this instance, I would. Sebastian returned to his house on Brook Street to be intercepted in the hall by his major-domo. There is a woman here to see you, my lord. A foreign woman and a child. They insisted upon waiting, so I have put them in the drawing room. A Mrs. Bellamy, said Sebastian sharply. That is the name she gave. Yes, my lord. Sebastian turned toward the stairs. Send up some tea and cakes, Morrie, and tell them I won't be but a moment. He found Mrs. Bellamy seated in one of the cane-backed chairs beside the front bow window. At the sight of him, her mouth parted in surprise, and she dropped the black-edged handkerchief she had been clutching. The child, Francesca, perched on the edge of a sofa near the empty hearth. A scorched, leather-bound volume clutched against her thin chest her eyes huge in a wan, pale face. Mrs. Bellamy, Francesca, my apologies for keeping you waiting. You should not have troubled yourself to make the journey up to London to see me. I would have been more than happy to wait upon you in Greenwich had you but sent word. The captain's widow cast her daughter a quick, enigmatic glance. Oh, my lord, I did not wish to trouble you at all. I thought Mr. Taylor must have left your card with me by mistake, and I came only in the hopes you might be able to direct me to him. It was Francesca who insisted we stay. Sebastian went to pour the tea that stood neglected upon the table. Please accept my apologies for the deception I practiced upon you in Greenwich. I fear if I approached Captain Bellamy under my own name, he might refuse to see me. Her brow wrinkled in confusion. And why would that be, my lord? 
I suspect the captain was warned not to speak to me. He held out a cup. Please, have some tea. She took the cup automatically, but did not drink it. He turned toward Francesca. And you, Miss Bellamy, would you care for some tea and cakes? No, thank you, she said with painful seriousness, and held out the leather-bound book. We've brought you this. What is it? asked Sebastian, not moving to take it from her. It was Mrs. Bellamy who answered. The ship's log, from the Harmony. The evening he... He fell in the river. Captain Bellamy spent hours sitting at the table after supper, reading the log and drinking rum. Before he went out, he threw it onto the hearth and lit a fire. But the fire didn't catch properly, and Francesca pulled it out. Sebastian watched the child run one hand over the log's charred binding. Have you read it? he asked, glancing at the widow. She flushed and shook her head. Too late, Sebastian remembered what Tom had told him in Greenwich, that the captain's young Brazilian wife was illiterate. No, she said, but Francesca has. Sebastian's gaze met the child's, and he saw there the horrified confirmation of everything he'd suspected, and more. You read what happened after the mutiny? he asked softly. I've read it all. Dear God, thought Sebastian. Aloud, he said, and still you brought it to me. She nodded, the muscles in her jaw held tight. It's why Adrian died, isn't it? It's why they all died. Because of what Papa and their parents did on that ship. Impossible to lie to the child. All he could say was, I suspect so. Do you know who is doing it? Not yet. She laid the log on the tea table and pushed it toward him. Perhaps this will help. Chapter 52 Hendon spent most of Saturday afternoon at Carlton House, dealing with a fretful prince. He was leaving the palace and heading up the mall when Cat Boleyn drew up her phaeton and pair beside him with a neat flourish. I'd like a word with you, my lord, she said. Drive with me a ways. Hendon looked at the woman before him. She wore a hunter green driving gown embellished with brass epaulets and set off by a cocky green chip hat with a curling ostrich feather. Hendon didn't hold with females driving phaetons. He dropped his gaze to the restive horseflesh between the traces and was tempted to plead some excuse. But the fact that she had deliberately sought him out raised a glimmer of hope in his breast. Perhaps he might find some way to scotch Devlin's marriage scheme after all. He stepped up to the curb and said quizzically, You wish me to ride with you in that rig? She let out a peal of musical laughter. I promise not to overturn you, my lord. George, she said to the groom seated beside her, wait for me here. Yes, miss. Hendon climbed up to settle in the space vacated by the groom. She gathered her reins, but before she gave the horses the office to start, she handed Hendon a small painted porcelain oval, a miniature of a dark-haired woman with flashing green eyes, and a smile that had once stolen Hendon's heart. Do you recognize this? Catbolin asked. Hendon's fist closed around the filigree-framed porcelain so hard the metal bit into his flesh. No. She cast him a swift glance. You lie, my lord. The tooth is writ plain on your face. Her name was Arabella Noland, and she was your mistress, was she not? What if she was? You think that showing me her portrait now will somehow soften my attitude toward your plans to marry my son? Well, let me tell you something, girl. You're fair and far out. She said nothing. Her attention all for the task of guiding her horses through the heavy Saturday afternoon traffic. Where did you get this? he asked at last. It was given to me by Arabella's sister, Emma Stone.
That hateful woman, said Hendon. Why should she do such a thing? Mrs. Stone also gave me this portrait of you. She held out another miniature, and after a moment, Hendon took it from her. They are a matched set. Did you give them to Arabella, I wonder? Were they part of your farewell gift to her when you discovered she was with child? No, he said gruffly, unable to grasp her point. They were a birthday gift. Why? She cast him a look he couldn't begin to comprehend. But you knew she had a child by you? Hennon worked his jaw back and forth. He saw no point in denying it. Have you told Devlin of this? No. She feathered the turning onto Whitehall. Did you know of the child? I knew. It's why she left me. She left you? Hendon grunted. I assumed you must know the whole story. It was my intention to take the child away after it was born. Give it to a good family, to be raised in the country. You would have taken her child away? The edge in her voice caught him by surprise. He shrugged. It's the usual practice. Arabella was distraught at the suggestion, but I thought she'd come around. Instead, she left without even telling me she was going. Wordlessly, Cat Bullin eased her pair around a brewer's wagon obstructing the road. Hendon let his gaze rove over her high cheekbones, the impish line of her nose, the sensuous curve of her lips. He'd always thought she had something of the look of Arabella. And then, from somewhere unbidden, came a powerful sense of disquiet. Why did Emma Stone give you these miniatures? he asked again. Emma Stone is my aunt. Hendon opened his mouth to deny it, to deny everything she was suggesting. But then he shut it again. If any other young woman had come to him with such a claim, he would never have accepted her statements at face value. But this woman, of all others, had no reason to claim him as her father, and every reason not to. My God, he whispered, I always thought you resembled her, but I never imagined. His voice trailed off. He stared across the tops of the elms in the park, their leaves suddenly so brutally green against the blue of the sky that he had to blink several times. What are you going to do? he asked at last. Tell Devlin. What else can I do? He studied the beautiful, haunting, familiar face beside him. He had always thought of her as his adversary, the woman he had to fight to prevent her from ruining Devlin's life. He found that he still thought of her that way. He had to think of her that way. He could allow himself nothing else. Not now. You could simply go away, he suggested. No, she said fiercely. I won't hurt him like that again, not a second time. Then let me be the one to tell him. He thought at first she meant to refuse him. She drew in a quick breath, then another. And it was only then that he realized she was fighting back tears. Very well, she said, drawing up before the palace. But you had best tell him right away, because the next time I see him, I will tell him if you have not. Chapter 53 Outside, the sun shone brightly on the last of what had been a fine September day. Sebastian could hear the sound of children laughing and calling to one another as he walked into his library and laid the Harmony's long-lost log on his desktop. For the briefest instant, he found himself hesitating. Then he opened the charred leather binding and stepped back into a dark and terrible episode. The voyager's first weeks out of India had been uneventful, and he skimmed them quickly. Some captains kept extensive, chatty logs. Not Bellamy. Bellamy's entries were terse, impatient, the hurried scribblings of a man who kept his log to satisfy his ship's owners rather than himself. He made only brief lists of his passengers, officers, and crew. 
Sebastian ran through the names, but there were no surprises. There had been twenty-one crew members. There, near the bottom of the list, Sebastian found the name Jack Parker, but he recognized none of the others. He flipped through the days, the long layover in Cape Town, the fine sailing as they headed up the west coast of Africa. And then, on the 5th of March, Bellamy had written, 2 a.m., strong gales with a heavy sea, clued up sails and hove to. 6 a.m., strong gales continue from the west-southwest, carried away the main topmast and mizzen masthead. 3 p.m., shipped a heavy sea, carried away the jolly boat and two crewmen. There was only one scrawled entry for the next day, 6th of March. 10 a.m., gale continues, no idea of our position at sea, reckoning impossible in storm. Two days later, Bellamy wrote, 8th of March, 7 p.m., shipped a heavy sea, washed away the longboat, tiller, unshipped the rudder, cabin boy Gideon suffered a broken arm, plucky lad. As bad as things had been, on the 9th of March they got worse. 11 a.m., pumps barely able to keep water from gaining, crew restive, cargo thrown overboard but ship still lying heavy in the water and listing badly to starboard. 2 p.m., ship suddenly righted though full of water, a dreadful sea making a fair breach over her from stem to stern. We are surely lost. 5 p.m. Gale dropped to strong breeze, employed getting what provisions possible by knocking out bow port. Saved twenty pounds of bread and ten pounds of cheese, some rum and flour, now stored in maintop. 10th of March, 6 a.m. Isaac Potter slipped into hold and drowned before we could get him out. Committed his body to the deep. 10 a.m. Crew restive. It is obvious that if we don't spot a ship soon, the harmony must be abandoned. Yet with no jolly boat or long boat, all cannot be saved. 11th of March, 2 p.m. Crew mutinied and abandoned ship, taking most of remaining provisions and water. Officers and passengers left aboard. God save our souls. 13th of March, 5 p.m. Stern stove in. I know not how we stay afloat. Made tent of spare canvas on forecastle, able to salvage a bit of rice and more flour from below. Rationing half a gill of water beach per day, but even at this rate it will not last long. 14th of March, 7 a.m. Small shark caught by means of running bowline. Sir Humphrey rigged up a tea kettle with a long pipe and a stretch of canvas to fashion a kind of distillation but it affords only one wine glass of water a day each, barely enough to maintain life. Gideon feverish. 16th of March, 10 a.m. Sir Humphrey has improved upon his distillation process. We can now manage nearly two wine glasses each per day. Barnacles gathered from side of vessel and eaten raw, but they will not last. 23rd of March, suffering much from hunger, Gideon hanging on, though I know not how. No nourishment now for seven days. 24th of March, 2 p.m. Saw a ship to windward, made signal of distress, but stranger hauled his wind away from us. 25th of March, 7 a.m. I like not the mutterings amongst the passengers. They have been awaiting the death of the cabin boy, Gideon, intending to feast upon his dead body but he has not died, and now there is talk of killing him. 5 p.m. A dark day for us all. Over the objections of myself and Mr. David Jarvis, the passengers and ship's officers voted to hasten Gideon's death. Mr. Jarvis sought to protect the lad, but the others rushed him, and in the altercation a cutlass was thrust through young Jarvis's side. I thought for a moment Gideon would be saved, for they would make their meal of Mr. Jarvis instead. But, though injured, the young man defended himself stoutly, and they returned to Gideon. 
Reverend Thornton delivered the last rites while Lord Stanton held Gideon down and Sir Humphrey Carmichael slit his throat. The poor lad's blood was caught in a basin and shared amongst the passengers. Then the body was cut up into quarters and washed in the sea. They drew lots for the choicest parts. The Reverend and Mrs. Thornton drew the poor lad's internal organs. Sir Humphrey an arm, Lord Stanton and Mr. Atkinson shared a leg, and so on. Even those such as Mr. Fairfax and Mrs. Dunlop, who had argued against the killing of the lad, did not fail to join in once the evil deed was done. Only Mr. David Jarvis, wounded though he was, refused to partake of the feast. Why should I condemn my soul to hell, he told them, so that I might live for one or two days more? I know well who you will fall upon once you've picked clean the bones of this poor lad. I myself found I could not quiet my stomach sufficient to eat the poor lad's flesh. But when they passed the cup of his blood, God help me, I drank. Pushing up from his desk, Sebastian went to pour himself a glass of brandy, but the brandy tasted bitter on his tongue, and he set it aside. Through the window overlooking the street, he gazed down on a lady's barouche driven at a smart clip up the street. A child chasing a hoop along the footpath glanced up to shout something, and the golden sunlight fell gracefully on his honey-coloured hair and ruddy cheeks. It was easy to condemn the passengers and officers of the Harmony, Sebastian realised, easy to sit in security and comfort and reassure oneself of one's own superior moral fibre and courage. But no man can truly know how he will act until faced with such a choice, to hold to his convictions and embrace death, or to kill and live. Reaching again for his brandy, Sebastian drank it down. Then he went back to his desk and read. 26th of March, 8 a.m. English frigate hove in sight, hoisted the ensign downward, and the stranger hauled his wind toward us. Remains of cabin boy thrown overboard, Mr. Jarvis holding on to life, but he lost consciousness as the sovereign hove to, and I doubt he will live to see another dawn. There was one last line, entered in a shaky scrawl. Then, nothing. 10 a.m. Committed his body to the deep. Chapter 54 Sebastian closed the log, then sat for a time, staring down at the charred leather. It was one thing to suspect that the passengers and officers of the Harmony had resorted to cannibalism and murder, but something else entirely to read the terse record of their long, horrible ordeal. The Harmony's log explained much about the recent killings that had before seemed incomprehensible. He now understood that the strangely varying mutilation to which each of the victims had been subjected corresponded exactly to the lots drawn by their parents after Gideon's murder. Adrian Bellamy had been spared the other's butchery, not because his killer had been interrupted, as they'd supposed, but because his father, Captain Bellamy, had not himself partaken of the dead cabin boy's flesh. Yet the deliberate ordering of the killings struck Sebastian as less logical. It made sense that Barclay Carmichael had died before Dominic Stanton, since Sir Humphrey Carmichael had personally slit Gideon's throat while Lord Stanton had held the boy down. But Reverend Thornton had simply given the boy last rites. Why had his child been the first to die? And why had Captain Bellamy's son been slated as second on the list? Whatever his reasoning, the killer had considered his ranking of the victim so important that he had reserved the mandrake route for Adrian Bellamy, even when the naval lieutenant's absence had forced the killer to move on to the next victim on his list. But what struck Sebastian as the most vexing question of all was, how had the killer known in such excruciating detail the events that had transpired aboard that ship? The only logical explanation that presented itself was that the killer had been there on the ship himself.
Was that possible? What if one of the crew members had been left behind when the others mutinied and abandoned the ship? Bellamy's log entries had been brief and sporadic. Would he have bothered to name one or two crewmen who'd been abandoned by their shipmates? Sebastian was just flipping back to Bellamy's listing of the Harmony's original twenty-one crew members when the sound of the knocker, followed by his father's voice in the hall, brought his head up. I thought you'd sworn never to darken my doorway again, said Sebastian, when the Earl appeared at the entrance to the library. Hendon jerked off his gloves and tossed them along with his hat and walking stick onto a nearby table. Something has come up. He went to stand before the empty hearth, his hands clasped behind his back, his weight rocking from his heels to the balls of his feet. I've never claimed to be a saint. You know that, he said gruffly. Sebastian leaned back in his chair, his gaze on the Earl's heavily jowled face. He had no doubt as to why his father was here. A man who had once offered a young actress twenty thousand pounds to leave his son alone was not likely to sit idle and let their marriage take place now without doing everything in his power to stop it. And then some. Sebastian gave his father a cold smile. I know you're no saint. I've kept mistresses over the years, after your mother left and before. I've made Cat my mistress. Now I intend to take her as my wife. For God's sake, Sebastian, just hear me out, please. This isn't easy. One of the women I had in my keeping was a young Irish woman by the name of Arabella, Arabella Noland. Her father was a clergyman from a small market town to the northwest of Waterford, a place called carrick on -Sure. Ever hear of it? No. It was the birthplace of Anne Boleyn. Sebastian knew a deep sense of uneasiness, although he had no idea where his father could possibly be going with all this. And? She came to London with her sister, Emma. Emma married a barrister by the name of Stone. She's made something of a name for herself over the years as a moralistic writer, much in the vein of Hannah Moore. Perhaps you've heard of her. I've heard of her, yes. Well, the younger sister, Arabella, was by far the prettier and the more lively. There was no dowry to speak of, and the family was from the meanest gentry, and Irish to boot. Arabella became your mistress, is that what you're saying? When was this? Twenty-some-odd years ago. You were still in leading strings. Sebastian pushed up from his chair. If you think by means of this tale to dissuade me from my marriage to Cat, let me finish. We were together for more than three years. Then she learned she was with child. Sebastian watched as his father swung away to brace his outstretched arms against the marble mantelpiece. It was a moment before he could go on. You know how such things are often handled. A servant delivers the infant to the parish, along with a small sum of money. Or the child is farmed out to a nursemaid in some mean hovel. They never survive. Perhaps that's the whole point, I don't know. But it's not what I was suggesting. I found a good home for the child. A family of respectable yeoman farmers, whom I had every intention of supervising carefully. But she didn't want to give up the child, I take it? Dark colour stained the Earl's cheeks. No. She begged me to abandon the scheme. I tried to make her understand that anything else was impossible. I even thought I'd succeeded. But then, several months before the child was to be born, she disappeared. I searched for her, but to no avail. Some time later, I received a note from Ireland. It said simply, You have a daughter. She is well. Do not attempt to find us. Hendon pushed away from the mantel and swung to face Sebastian. This morning, Emma Stone paid a visit to Cat Bullin. It seems the woman is Cat's aunt. She brought her these. Reaching into his pocket, 
he drew forth two miniatures that he laid on the desk beside Sebastian. They're portraits of her parents. The woman in the first painting was a stranger, although it was easy enough to trace the likeness to Cat in the beguiling juxtaposition of that childish nose and the full sensuous lips. The second portrait was of the Earl of Hendon as he had been twenty-five years ago. Sebastian stared down at the twin porcelain ovals framed in filigree and felt an explosive welling of denial and fury and fear. No! He slammed away from the desk. Mother of God! Is there nothing to which you will not stoop in your effort to prevent this marriage? No, said Hendon, in rare honesty. But even I could not have invented this. I don't believe any of it. Do you hear me? I don't believe it. Hendon's jaw worked back and forth. Talk to Miss Berlin. Talk to Mrs. Emma Stone. Have no fear that I shall. They'll tell you the same tale. Sebastian swung his arm across the desktop, sending the miniatures flying. God damn you! God damn you all to hell! Hendon's eyes, those vivid, blue, sincere eyes that were so inescapably like cats, twitched with pain. You can't blame me for the fact that you fell in love with that woman. Then who the hell do I blame? raged Sebastian. God. I don't believe in God, said Sebastian and he slammed out of the house. Chapter 55 Sebastian went first to Harwich Street. Where is she? he said, when the maid Elspeth opened the door. Elspeth stared at him with wide, frightened eyes. Miss Pauline isn't here. Sebastian pushed past her. Cat, he called, and heard his voice echo through the empty house. He ran up the stairs to the drawing room, then took the stairs to the second floor, two at a time. Cat! A minute later, he was back downstairs. Where is she, damn it? he demanded, coming upon Elspeth in the entrance hall. The maid looked up from the oil lamp she'd been trimming. I don't know. She went out. You know something you're not telling. What is it? I don't know anything. Something strange is going on, but I don't know what it is. I swear I don't. Did she say when she'd be back? Tomorrow. She said she probably wouldn't be back until tomorrow. Probably. All I know is what she said. Sebastian slammed his open palm against the panelled wall and left. He went next to Emma Stone's small house in Camden. The woman was famous for writing wildly popular, improving tracts, with titles such as Christian Piety and moral sketches for the next generation. Had Hendon named anyone else, Sebastian could have dismissed his wild claims without hesitation. But Sebastian found it impossible to imagine Mrs. Emma Stone lending herself to one of the Earl's schemes. Pausing on the footpath, Sebastian stared up at the proper brick facade before him. He knew only the faintest outlines of Cat's earlier history but what he knew fit uncomfortably well with Hendon's tale. She'd told him once that her father was an English lord, but her mother had left London before Cat was born to take refuge in her native Ireland. Sebastian knew what the soldiers had done to Cat's mother and stepfather. He knew, too, that after their deaths, Cat had been taken in by her mother's sister. Sebastian had formed a hazy image of a self-righteous, ostentatiously religious woman who'd punished her niece's accusations of her husband's misconduct with the whip. Sebastian studied the silent rows of neatly curtained windows. Had it been from this house that Cat had fled as a child into a life on the streets? She had never named her aunt as Mrs. Emma Stone. But then... There was much that Cat had never told him. He became aware of the sensation of being watched. As he climbed the short flight of steps to the front door, he saw the lace curtain at one of the upstairs windows shift slightly, then settle back into place. He half expected his knock to go unanswered. Instead, the door was opened almost immediately by a thin slip of a maid with jade-green eyes and a scattering of freckles across her nose who looked at him with undisguised curiosity and asked breathlessly, 
Are you Lord Devlin? Yes, said Sebastian in surprise. The girl stepped back and opened the door wide. Mrs. Stone said to bring you straight up. Sometimes our worst dreams don't come when we're asleep. The nightmares that came to Sebastian in the bowels of the night were familiar things. Disjointed memories of slashing sabres and exploding ordnance punctuated by the screams of dying men and maimed horses. He'd learned to live with those dreams, with those memories. But he wasn't sure how he was going to learn to live with this. He wandered the darkened streets of London, down narrow lanes of shuttered shops and quiet houses. A mist had settled over the city, painting the pavement with a wet sheen that reflected the light from the street lamps and an occasional passing carriage. He kept trying to comprehend the incomprehensible, how a love, once so beautiful and life-sustaining, could have suddenly been transformed into something unclean and vile. Of all the taboos with which Englishmen and women fortified themselves against the horrors of savagery and bestiality, only two were so unforgivably loathsome as to be spoken of in frightened whispers. The prohibition against the eating of human flesh and the sexual union of those bound by the closest of family ties. Father and daughter, sister and brother. He knew he should recoil in horror. A part of him did recoil in horror. But a part of him still ached for the future that had been snatched from him, for the woman he would have made his wife. He wanted to get on his horse and gallop out beyond the last straggling hamlets. He wanted to ride through woods lashed by a wild wind, with none but the cold and distant stars for companions. He wanted to ride until he reached the crashing waves of the sea, and feel the salty spray rise up to meet him as he spurred ever on to oblivion. A burst of laughter from an open door brought his head around. He paused for a moment, shuddering, recognizing the danger of being alone, and far too sober. Wiping a hand across his face, he turned his steps toward Pickering Place, unaware of the slight figure watching him anxiously from the shadows. Paul Gibson pushed past the billiard tables toward the more select rooms filled with scattered faro and whist tables that lay beyond. The air he breathed smelled strongly of brandy and tobacco, and the unmistakably sweet tang of hashish. He was in one of the most expensive and decadent of the gaming hells off Pickering Place, and he had to keep reminding himself to clench his jaw shut for fear of staring around like some gape-mouthed lout just up from the country. Gibson had been in his share of hells and brothels before, and opium dens too, for that matter, but he'd never been in a place quite like this one. The walls were hung with watered silk, the mirrors large and framed in ornate gilt wood, the cloths on the supper tables of starched linen. From somewhere in the distance came the lilting strains of a string quartet, the music forming an odd counterpoint to the high-pitched laughter of women and the ceaseless rattle of the dice-box. Gibson lifted a glass from one of the waiters who circled the rooms bearing trays of claret and brandy. A woman, wearing a scarlet gown with a shockingly low décolletage, cast him a speculative glance, then brushed past him. Gibson thought the diamonds in her ears looked real. But then, what did a poor Irish doctor know? He fortified himself with a sip of brandy and pushed on. Scanning the gaming tables and the crowd around the whirling roulette wheel, he followed the gently curving staircase up to the next floor. The lights here were dimmer, but not dim enough to hide the bare flesh and unmistakable postures of the men and women who cavorted in groups of two, three, or more on low sofas and scattered cushions. Gibson felt his cheeks heat with embarrassment and looked pointedly away. He found Viscount Devlin sprawled on the velvet cushion of an embrasure overlooking the darkened street below, one fist wrapped around the neck of a bottle of good French brandy. As Gibson watched, a half-naked woman stroked one hand over his chest and down his stomach. 
But Devlin shook his head and brought his hand down on hers to stop its slow descent. The woman mewed softly in disappointment, then moved away. The Viscount raised the brandy to his lips and drank deep. Gibson had been afraid he might find his friend in one of those knots of groping naked flesh, but Devlin seemed more interested in drinking himself to death than drowning his pain in sex. There you are, me lad, said Gibson heartily, for the benefit of anyone who might be listening. Sorry I took so long. You haven't forgotten you promised to meet my sister tonight, have you? Devlin swung his head to stare directly at him. The feral yellow eyes were glittering and dangerous. Your sister? Ah, she have forgotten. I have a hackney waiting outside. I know the bow has dictated that no gentleman should condescend to ride in a hackney, but my carriage is being repaired, so I'm afraid there's not much we can do about it. You don't own a carriage, said Sebastian. Nor do you have a sister. Now, that's where you're out, my friend. I do indeed have a sister. But seeing as how she's taken the veil in a nunnery near Killarney, I don't think you'd want to meet her. Especially not in your present condition. Devlin laughed and pushed to his feet. His cravat was rumpled and his hair more disheveled than normal. But his gait was steady enough as they walked down the stairs. It was only when they reached the narrow lane outside the gaming hell's discreet door that the Viscount paused to lean against the rough brick wall and squeeze his eyes shut. Bloody hell, he said after a moment. Gibson studied his friend's pale face and tightly clenched jaw. I haven't seen you this fox since that night in San Domingo. I haven't been this fox since that night in San Domingo. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever been this foxed. Devlin opened his eyes and stared at him. What the devil are you doing here? Tom was worried about you. The dangerous glitter was back in the Viscount's eyes. The devil, you say? That's right. Gibson clapped his hand on his friend's shoulder then laughed softly when Devlin winced. And tomorrow, when you sober up, you can thank him. The doctor waited until they were in the hackney headed toward Tower Hill before saying, I don't suppose you've heard the news. Devlin had been gazing silently out the window, but at that he swung his head to stare at Gibson. What news? They've arrested the butcher of the West End a country gentleman from Hertfordshire. Devlin was suddenly almost frighteningly sober. Brandon Forbes? That's it. But he didn't do it. Gibson raised one eyebrow. Can you prove it? No. Then he'll hang for it for sure. Either that or some mob will pull him out of his cell and tear him to pieces. People are afraid. They want someone's blood, and quick. Stop the carriage, said Devlin. Gibson sprang to signal the driver. Why? What is it? Devlin shoved open the door. I think I'm going to be sick. Chapter 56 Sunday, 22nd of September, 1811 Charles, Lord Jarvis, spent as little time as possible in his house in Berkeley Square but he always attended Sunday morning services at St. James's Chapel with his harridan of a mother, his half-mad wife, and his determinedly unwed daughter, Hero. After church, it was his practice to pass several hours in his library dealing with affairs of state before sitting down to Sunday dinner with his family. He was very conscious of the need for the better classes to set a proper example for the lower orders, and church attendance and devotion to family were an important part of that example. It was a duty he had sought to impress upon his daughter, although with indifferent success. On this particular Sunday, he returned from chapel to find the reports of several of his agents awaiting his attention on his desk. Devlin's interference with his plans to use the actress Cat Boleyn to ferret out the identity of Napoleon's new spymaster had forced Jarvis to fall back on more traditional means, 
but so far his agents had proved unsuccessful. He was glancing through their reports when he was interrupted by a cautious knock. Yes, what is it? he said, without looking up. A Mr. Russell Yates to see you, my lord. Jarvis's head came up. What the bloody hell does he want? Shall I tell him you're not at home, my lord? Jarvis tightened his jaw. No, send him in. Russell Yates came in, bringing with him the scent of well-bred horses and a cool morning rain. From his manly chest and powerful shoulders to the glint of pirate's gold in his left ear, he exuded an aggressive form of masculinity not often seen amongst the members of the ton. And it was all for show. Jarvis had dedicated his life to reading people and manipulating them. He was good at it, and he rarely made mistakes. Yet once, Jarvis had underestimated this man. It would not happen again. Very deliberately, Jarvis leaned back in his chair, but did not rise. Have a seat, Mr. Yates. Yates adjusted the tails of his dark blue morning coat and settled in a leather chair beside the empty hearth. Please accept my apologies for interrupting you on the Sabbath day, my lord. Jarvis merely inclined his head. It was flowery flummery, and they both knew it. I am here, first of all, continued Yates, to share with you the news of my good fortune. The lovely Miss Cat Boleyn has consented to become my wife. Jarvis drew a gold snuff box from his pocket and flipped it open. Indeed, it was my understanding that Miss Boleyn had consented to become the Viscountess Devlin. Things changed. So it seems. Jarvis lifted a pinch of snuff to one nostril. You understand, I assume, that Miss Boleyn has some, shall we say, unfortunate associations in her past? Actually, that is my primary purpose for coming to see you today. While it's true Miss Boleyn has in the past engaged in certain activities that are better forgotten, the same could be said of many of us. Yeats's smile widened to show his teeth. Even you, my lord, have been involved in episodes that would be best left unknown. Jarvis closed his snuffbox with a snap. He was not one to bluster or rage, for he had learned long ago to control his emotions. He did at times give vent to anger, but only when it served his purpose. It would not serve his purpose now. He tucked his snuffbox away and said calmly, The understanding we reached on these matters still stands. I assume you are here merely to reassure me that as long as Miss Boleyn's secrets are safe, others are safe. That's a fair representation of the situation, yes. Good. Then we understand each other. Yates rose to his feet. Jarvis waited until he was at the door to add, There does seem a waste. Yates turned. How's that, my lord? Such a beautiful woman married to a man uninterested in women. If he'd been hoping for a rise, Jarvis was disappointed. Yates merely smiled and said, Good day, my lord. Some twenty minutes later, Jarvis was still sitting at his desk when his daughter, Hero, appeared at the door. The most vexatious thing, Papa. Grandmama has thrown her chamber pot at the upstairs parlour maid, and now both the maid and cook have quit. The cook? Jarvis looked around, his attention caught. Why the cook? Cook is Emily's aunt. Emily? Who the deuce is Emily? The upstairs parlour maid. Good God, roared Jarvis. And what would you have me do about it? The petty affairs of this household are not in my province. I don't expect you to do anything about it, said Hero. I have simply come to warn you that dinner will be delayed. Dinner? But who is cooking it? I am, said his daughter, with unruffled equanimity and closed the door behind her. Jarvis stared at the closed panel for a moment, then rose to pour himself a brandy. It had been a trying week. The day might have been overcast, but the light streaming in through Paul Gibson's kitchen windows was still bright enough to hurt Sebastian's eyes. He squeezed them shut and ran a hand across his beard-roughened chin.
Remind me why I stayed here rather than going home. I need a shave, and a bath, and clean clothes. Paul Gibson answered him from across the room. You needed to talk. Sebastian opened one eye. I did? How much did I say? Enough. Gibson came to stand at the far side of the battered kitchen table. I'm sorry, Sebastian. Sebastian looked away. Here. Gibson plunked a tankard of ale on the boards before him. This will help your head. You'd best drink it before you hear this morning's news. Sebastian brought his gaze back to his friend's face. Why? What's happened? It's Felix Atkinson's twelve-year-old son, Anthony. He's missing. Chapter 57 Sebastian found Felix Atkinson in the drawing room of his prosperous West End home. The East India Company man stood with his back to the room, his gaze fixed on the scene outside the window overlooking Portland Place. In a damask-covered chair off to one side, a pale-haired woman in her early thirties wept quietly into a handkerchief. As far as Sebastian could see, her husband was making no attempt to comfort her. I'd like a word with you, Sebastian told Atkinson. Alone. Atkinson swung to face him, all bluster and trembling affront. Really, my lord, now is hardly the time. Sebastian cut him off. I don't think you want Mrs. Atkinson to hear what I have to say. A rush of colour darkened the other man's cheeks. He cast a quick glance at his wife, then looked away. We can speak in the morning room. They had barely crossed into the morning room before Sebastian's hands closed over Atkinson's shoulders and spun him around to slam his spine up against the nearest wall. You bloody, self-obsessed, lying son of a bitch, said Sebastian, spitting out each word through gritted teeth. Atkinson gasped and made as if to pull away. How dare you! How dare you lay hands upon me in my home! Sebastian pressed his forearm against the man's throat, pinning him to the wall. I know what happened on that ship. I know about Gideon Forbes, and I know what really happened to David Jarvis. Atkinson went utterly still. You can't. I read the log. The log? But the log was lost. Bellamy said the log was lost. He lied. Sebastian shoved his forearm up under the man's chin harder. You all lied. What did you do? Get together after Thornton's and Carmichael's sons were killed and swear one another to secrecy? What choice did we have? You could have told the truth. Atkinson's tongue darted out to moisten his lips. How could we? No one would have understood about the boy. You have no idea what it was like on that ship. The fear, the endless days and nights of hunger. That kind of hunger. It's like a yawning pit of fire in your belly, consuming you. You'll do anything when you're hungry like that. You might. Yet people starve to death on the streets of London all the time. They don't kill and eat each other. Atkinson sucked in a breath that shook his entire frame. The boy was dying. All we did was hasten the hour of his death. David Jarvis should never have tried to stop us. Is that what you tell yourself? What about the Sovereign? We didn't know the frigate was out there. We thought we would die without seeing another ship. How could we have known? That's why men shouldn't take it upon themselves to play God. Sebastian shifted his grip. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to think very hard before answering. After the crew mutinied and abandoned ship, were any of the men left aboard? Crewmen, you mean? No. Only Bellamy, the three ship's officers, and the boy. Why? Who do you think is doing this? You have some idea, don't you? Who is it? His voice rose. What aren't you telling me? Sebastian simply shook his head. It hasn't struck you as peculiar that this killer knows exactly which lots you each drew after the boy's murder. 
the tick began to play at the edge of Atkinson's mouth. Peculiar. It's terrifying. It's as if he were on the ship with us. But that's impossible, isn't it? Isn't it? Sebastian gave the man a nasty smile. You tell me. I told you before. I don't know who's doing this. I don't know. It's too late to save yourself. When Jarvis hears you murdered his son, you're going to wish you did die on that ship. It wasn't me. I didn't have a cutlass. It was one of the others. You think that will make a difference to Jarvis? Atkinson's entire face convulsed. No, I know it won't. We all know it won't. Why else do you think we've kept silent? Why? Because you value your own lives more than you value the lives of your sons. Sebastian let the man go and stepped back. When was your boy taken? Atkinson adjusted his cravat and gave the lapels of his coat a twitch. This morning, early. He was gone from his bed when the household awakened. He was taken from the house? I thought you had Bow Street runners watching him. Two of them. Someone broke the lock on the back door. And where were your runners while all this was happening? One was watching the front of the house from across the street, and the other was found insensible in the garden. Sebastian suppressed an oath. If the killer followed his established pattern, the boy's butchered body would be discovered in some prominent spot early tomorrow morning. It was still possible that the boy was alive someplace, but their chances of finding him before he was killed diminished with each passing minute. Let me see the boy's room, said Sebastian. Atkinson stared at him. What? You heard me. I want to see the room from which the boy was taken. Quickly. Anthony Atkinson had occupied a chamber on the third floor, just off the schoolroom. It was a typical boy's bedroom, its shelves crammed with books and birds' nests, and all manner of wondrous and special things. Standing on the braided hearthrug, Sebastian thought about the tow-headed lad he'd glimpsed in the square, his cheeks flushed, his eyes bright with merriment. The boy might have been younger than the other victims, Sebastian realized, but he was a sturdy, healthy lad. He would not have been easy to subdue, especially without waking either his family or the servants. A small girl's voice came from the doorway to the schoolroom. Are you looking for Antony? He's not here. Sebastian turned to find young Miss Atkinson watching him with wide, solemn eyes. He went to hunker down before her. Did you hear Antony leave this morning? She shook her head. No, I didn't hear anything. Have you noticed anyone watching you the last few days? A man, perhaps? Or maybe a woman? Again, she shook her head. Frustrated, Sebastian shoved to his feet. It was when he was turning to leave that he saw it a glint of blue and white porcelain peeking out from beneath the counterpane. He knew what it was, even before he stooped to pick it up. It was a Chinese vial. An opium vial. Chapter 58 Sebastian was paying off his hackney outside Newgate Prison when he heard a man's high-pitched voice calling his name. Lord Devlin. Sebastian turned to find Sir Henry Lovejoy coming out of the prison's formidable gates. I stopped by your house this morning, my lord, but was told you were not in. I assume you've heard the news about young Anthony Atkinson. Dreadful business, this just dreadful. Sebastian stepped out of the path of a passing ironmonger's wagon. Who was it pushed for the arrest of Brandon Forbes? Sir James Reed and Sir William both. Lord Jarvis has brought considerable pressure to bear on Bow Street to solve this case, and the magistrates are always anxious to curry favour with the palace. Sebastian squinted up at the prison's dark, oppressive façade. And now that Antony Atkinson is missing, will Mr. Forbes be released? Sir Henry sighed. I fear not. 
Sir James, in particular, contends that the disappearance of the young Atkinson boy in no way absolves Mr. Forbes of the earlier murders. That's preposterous. That's the law. Thanks to your admirable detective work, it appears that Mr. Forbes possesses a powerful motive to have committed the murders, and I fear the gentleman has no verifiable alibi for the nights in question. Sebastian swore long and hard. So what exactly is being done to find Anthony Atkinson? As I understand it, Bow Street has some twenty men combing the countryside around Forbes' estate. Bloody hell, the boy's not there. So it would seem. Sebastian found Brandon Forbes seated at a writing desk in one corner of a surprisingly large room overlooking the street. The rattle of the jailer's keys brought the gentleman's head around. At the sight of Sebastian, he grunted. It's you I have to thank for my being here, I take it. Sebastian ducked his head through the doorway and waited while the jailer locked the door behind him. Newgate could be relatively comfortable for those with a few extra pounds to buy themselves a private cell, some furniture and bedding, and food. But the dank air still reeked of excrement and despair, and the threat of the hangman's noose was like an unseen presence in the room. Indirectly, Sebastian admitted. Forbes lay aside his pen. The bluff, good-humoured country squire who'd walked the fields of his Hertfordshire estate was gone. The man before Sebastian now was pale and anxious. You think I did it? he asked. You think I butchered all those young men? No. Forbes grunted. Why not? Everyone else does. My arrest ties it all up in a neat package. Except for this morning's disappearance of young Anthony Atkinson. Yes, well, I could have had an accomplice, couldn't I? That's what they're saying. Someone who nabbed young Atkinson to confound the authorities and make it appear that I'm innocent. I don't think so. Forbes pushed up from his desk and went to stand at the window overlooking the front of the prison. That's where they hang them, you know. Those who have been condemned to death. Right there, in front of the prison. You ever see a hanging? Yes. I saw one once, in St. Albans, when I was a boy. My father took me to see it over my mother's objections. Some lad who'd pinched a bolt of cloth from a shop. I was ten at the time, and I don't think the boy was much older. They botched his hanging something terrible. Took him fifteen or twenty minutes to die. In the end, the hangman wrapped his own arms around the poor lad's legs and pulled in an attempt to break the boy's neck, but even that didn't work. He suffocated slowly. Very slowly. I won't let you hang for this, said Sebastian. A wry smile touched the man's lips. Pardon me if I'm not comforted. Sebastian searched the other man's plain, weather-darkened face. Is there anything else you can tell me about your son? Anything at all that might help? No. No one you know who might have felt compelled to avenge the boy's death? The man's face paled, and Sebastian knew he was worrying about the suspicion that would now also fall on his surviving sons, the boy studying at Cambridge and his older brother. No. I didn't mean your older sons, said Sebastian. Forbes went to sit on the edge of the bed, his hands clasped between his knees, his head bowed. After a moment, he said, It is possible that someone... He hesitated, then swallowed hard. You see, Gideon wasn't actually my own child. Oh, I raised him as my son, and God knows I loved him like a son. But he was not the issue of my loins. What? Forbes kept his gaze on the stone paving beneath his feet, a tide of colour staining his cheeks. It's not the sort of thing a man speaks of ordinarily, but my second wife, Gideon's mother, she was already some three months gone with child when I married her. Sebastian leaned forward. The father? Who was he? 
I don't know. She never told me, and I never asked. Her parents never knew she was with child. I gather they had objected to the match because of the man's religion. Where was your wife raised? In Hertfordshire? No, she was from a village called Hollingbourne, in Kent. Sebastian thrust up from his seat. Is that near Avery? Forbes' head came up, his mouth slack with surprise. How did you know? Chapter 59 Sebastian could hear thunder rumbling in the distance by the time he reached Brook Street. He set his groom, Giles, scrambling to saddle the Arab, then sent for Tom. Sebastian was in his library, loading a small pistol, when Tom scooted into the room. I want you to find Sir Henry, said Sebastian, slipping the flintlock into his pocket as he briefly ran through the conversation with Forbes. Tell him what I've discovered and where I've gone. He squinted up at the leaden sky and paused to throw a cloak over his shoulders. It was going to be a wet ride. I could come with you, Tom said. He had to trot to keep up as Sebastian crossed the gardens toward the stables, jerking on his leather riding gloves as he went. You could send Giles with a message and— No. This man is a killer. I want you well away from him. You deliver the message to Sir Henry, and then you await me here. That's an order. Sebastian gathered the black's reins, but paused to give the boy a hard look. Do you understand me? Tom's shoulders slumped. Aye, governor. Sebastian settled into his saddle and felt the mare tremble beneath him, as if she could sense his urgency and was eager to be off. But he held her in check long enough to lean down and say to Tom, Disobey me in this, and I swear to God I'll take it out of your hide. Then he tightened his knees to send the Arab thundering down the mews. The rain began in earnest just after Sebastian clattered across the bridge into Blackfriars Road. This was a mean part of London, the street narrow and unpaved and filled with clutches of ragged, hollow-eyed children and crippled beggars who forced Sebastian to hold the Arab in until he was well past Greenwich Road. By the time he reached Blackheath, the rain had become a steady, wind-driven torrent that stung his cheeks and ran down the back of his neck and rapidly turned the pike into a dangerous quagmire. How many hours had passed since Anthony Atkinson's abduction? He wondered, pushing on. Four? Five? A part of him acknowledged that the boy might already be dead, but he clung to the hope that Anthony might yet live. It couldn't be easy for a man dedicated to saving lives to steal himself to the brutal murder of a child. It struck Sebastian as ironic how a single, easily overlooked piece of information could provide a solution if one simply shifted his perspective and considered it from a different angle. He wondered how the killer had learned the details of the Harmony's ordeal, yet he'd given little thought to Reverend Thornton's wife, who must have faced her coming death last Christmas, weighed down by the onerous guilt upon her soul. From where could she have sought absolution for the sins of murder and cannibalism? not from the rector, her husband, whose guilt was as great as her own. And so she must have chosen to unburden herself to her dear family friend and physician, Dr. Aaron Newman, never imagining that the man to whom she confided her terrible secret was actually the dead boy's natural father. Yet even armed with the truth of what had happened to Gideon Forbes and David Jarvis, Newman must have known himself to be at point nonplus. It had been impossible for him to move against the Harmony survivors in a court of law, even if the ship's passengers hadn't included some of the most powerful men in the kingdom. Newman had no proof of what had occurred on that ship, beyond a dying woman's testimony given without other witnesses. And so he had decided to wreak his own terrible form of revenge, killing not his son's murderers, but their sons. Thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning. And if an ox have gored a son or have gored a daughter, according to this judgment shall it be done unto him. 
How much suffering and death had been wrought upon the world, Sebastian wondered, by a literal interpretation of that ancient biblical passage. Wrapping the folds of his cloak around him, he kneed the mare on ever faster through the pounding rain. He noticed the two horsemen at the first toll. They rode up, hats pulled low, collars turned against the wind and rain just as Sebastian was passing through the gate. One of them, a tall man with a broken nose, reached down to hand their toll to the gatekeeper. He glanced up, his gaze catching Sebastian's eye just as Sebastian set his spurs to the mare's flanks. After that, he was aware of them behind him, two rough-coated men riding as hard as he. Any men out on such a day would be riding hard, but when Sebastian deliberately slowed his pace at a small hamlet, the men dropped back. Bloody hell. He suppressed the urge to whirl and confront them. He didn't have time for this. He drove the mare on, faster. He could feel her dainty hooves slipping in the soupy, churned mud of the road. Rain slid in cold rivulets down his cheeks, ran into his eyes. He was shaking his head, trying to clear them, when the mare stumbled. She pitched forward with a frightened squeal. He just managed to kick his feet free of the stirrups before she went down and rolled. His back slammed against the ground hard enough to drive the wind from his body, leaving him gasping in agony. He was aware of the sounds of the mare scrambling to her feet, but he couldn't move. Rain beat against his face, ran into his open mouth as he fought to draw the breath back into his aching chest. Floundering in the mud, he managed to prop himself up on one elbow. He opened his eyes just in time to see the muddy sole of a man's boot driving toward his face. Then all was black. Chapter 60 He awoke to pain and the mists of confusion. The confusion lifted slowly. He remembered the mare stumbling, the sound of boots in the mud, an explosion of pain in his face. He could taste blood in his mouth, feel more blood mingling with mud and rain. Then he realized the pain in his jaw came not only from that kick, but also from the gag that pried his lips apart, making it difficult to swallow. Cautiously, he opened his eyes. He lay on his back, his hands twisted awkwardly beneath him and tied at the wrist. His ankles were tied, too, and suspended oddly in the air. Squinting against the rain, he saw that someone had taken one end of the rope that bound his ankles and looped it over an oak branch that stretched above him. He remembered the way Barclay Carmichael had been found butchered and hanging upside down from a mulberry tree in St. James's Park and knew a rush of raw fear. His hat and cloak were both gone, along with the reassuring weight of the pistol he'd slipped into his coat pocket. He'd obviously been dragged away from the road, for he was now in a clearing of what looked like a thick stand of oaks. The smell of wet grass, dirt, and leaves was strong. He could hear the rain still pounding on the leaves overhead, but the canopy sheltered him from the worst of the downpour. Shifting his head slowly so as not to attract attention, he scanned the small clearing. He could see only one man, a small, thin man with overlong blonde hair who leaned against the trunk of a tree some twenty-five feet away. Beyond him, Sebastian could see his own black Arab and one other horse, a big bay. There had been two men following him, Sebastian remembered. The second man must have ridden away, either for reinforcements or to notify whoever had hired them. The man leaning against the tree had the air of someone waiting. Sebastian studied his guard more closely. He stood with one knee bent, the sole of his boot propped against the trunk behind him, his hat pulled low on his forehead against the rain. He looked young, very young, his clothes rough. Rougher than those of the killer who had attacked Sebastian on the hoy, more like those of the men who had broken into Cat's house Friday night. A sudden wave of nausea roiled Sebastian's stomach so that he had to squeeze his eyes shut for a moment. But he knew he needed to make his move now, before anyone else returned. His breath coming shallow and quick, Sebastian opened his eyes and squinted up at his feet. They might have found his pistol, 
but it had evidently never occurred to the men who had bound and gagged and tethered him by his ankles to a tree that a nobleman might be carrying a knife in his boot. He could still feel the subtle pressure of that small, deadly blade against his calf. The hard part would be getting the knife out without attracting his guard's attention. Moving slowly, Sebastian straightened his legs as much as possible and locked his knees while shifting his weight subtly to the right. The sheath was well-oiled, and he was hoping gravity alone might be enough to loosen the knife. It wasn't. He threw a quick glance at the man leaning against the tree. He hadn't moved. Gritting his teeth, Sebastian gave a series of short, sharp kicks upward with his right heel. The knife slipped out of its sheath to land with a soft thump in the wet leaf litter beside his hip. By lifting his hips in the air, Sebastian was able to shift his bound arms over far enough to close his fingers around the handle of the knife. He reversed the blade, angling it carefully toward the rope that bound his wrists. The point nicked the pad of his palm and he swore silently to himself. Then he felt the blade bite into the rope. It wasn't easy, holding his hips in the air, balancing his weight on his shoulders while sawing blindly. Rain pattered on his face, ran into his eyes. Twice the knife slipped, slicing into his wrists. He could feel the blood slippery on his hands, on the knife. He became aware of a vibration in the wet earth beneath him, horses' hooves coming fast from somewhere off to the left where the road must lie. He willed them to keep going. They slowed. The man beside the tree hunched his shoulders against the rain, his head still bowed, as if he were oblivious to the sounds of approach. Sebastian felt the last of the rope give way beneath his blade just as a man's shout cut through the dripping woods. The hireling beside the tree lifted his head and glanced back at Sebastian. Sebastian lay perfectly still, his hands twisted out of sight beneath him, the knife clutched in one blood-slicked fist. Lord Stanton rode into the clearing, mounted on a fine grey, and flanked by two coarsely dressed men. Is he alive? Stanton demanded. The blonde-headed hireling pushed away from the tree and went to hold the baron's horse. Last I looked. Stanton grunted and swung down from the saddle. Sebastian looked beyond him to the two other men. One, a tall, thin-framed man with a broken nose— he recognized from the toll gate. The man helping the blonde youth with the horses was the survivor from Friday night's assault on Harridge Street. His boots crunching, a litter of twigs and wet leaves, Stanton halted in the center of the clearing, his gaze on Sebastian's face. So, you're still alive. Sebastian blinked, his mouth held rigid by the gag. The Baron swiped one forearm across his wet face. You have no one but yourself to blame for this situation. Indeed, I went out of my way to discourage your involvement. I feared all along it would come to this. Sebastian stared up into the Baron's pale, fleshy face and marveled at the man's capacity for self-deception. If Sebastian had been less agile, or his hearing less acute, it would have come to this in the dead of the night on Harridge Street, or before, on the Hoy, on the Thames. Have you succeeded, then? Stanton asked. Do you know who killed my son? His eyes wide, his grip on the knife handle behind his back tightening. Sebastian nodded. Stanton motioned to the tall, thin-framed man with a broken nose. Take that gag out of his mouth so he can talk. Sebastian waited, tense and ready, while the man came to crouch down beside him. Lift your head so as I can get at the knot, he ordered. Sebastian obligingly raised his head. He waited until the man was fully occupied picking at the knot. Then Sebastian moved. Tilting his hips up so that his shoulders took all his weight, Sebastian grabbed a fistful of the man's coat with one hand, holding him steady, while he drove the knife deep into the man's chest. The man convulsed, pale eyes widening with shock, but Sebastian was already jerking the dagger out of the man's chest. Holding the hireling's body like a shield, Sebastian jackknifed up and hacked desperately at the rope binding his ankles. What is he doing? he heard Stanton bellow. Don't just stand there, you fool. Stop him. 
The young, yellow-haired man reached Sebastian just as the knife freed his ankles. Oi, what the— Sebastian twisted so that his falling feet came down against the side of the man's head with a solid thwunk. The man staggered to his knees. Sebastian hit the sodden ground in a roll and came up onto his feet at a run. With Stanton and the third hireling between Sebastian and the horses, he had no choice but to plunge downhill away from them. He felt a stinging slice across his upper arm the instant before he heard the boom of a pistol reverberate through the forest. Bloody hell! The smooth leather soles of his riding boots slipping and skidding in the wet leaf mold, Sebastian zigzagged through gnarled old oak trees, one hand clamped against his bleeding arm. You, horn, he heard Stanton shout. Stay with the horses in case he tries to circle back. Burke, come with me. Wet branches slapped Sebastian in the face. His coat caught on a hawthorn, and he breathed another quick oath, ripping it free. Given enough time, he had no doubt he could outrun Stanton and his men. But time was the one thing Sebastian didn't have. He scanned the trees ahead, swerving toward an ancient oak with stout branches arching low to the ground. Slipping his knife back into its sheath, he was reaching for the lowest branch when his gaze fell on the tumble of stones lying half-hidden in the leaf litter at the tree's roots. He hesitated, then swooped to select a particularly lethal-looking chunk with jagged edges. He hefted it for a moment, testing its weight. Then he scrambled into the tree. Chapter 61 Sebastian found his left arm unexpectedly weak, so he made more noise than he would have liked climbing into the ancient oak. Crouching on the lowest branch, he rested his back against the rough trunk, his breath coming hard and fast. From some distance to his right came Stanton's voice. Devlin, you might as well give yourself up and stop this foolishness. You don't have a chance. There are still three of us. Sebastian could see them now. Stanton and his man, Burke. They were keeping close together, and they were going the wrong way, cutting along the side of the hill. For a moment, Sebastian considered simply staying where he was, except he knew that if they gave up and left, they would take his horse with them. Casting a critical eye over the oak's nearest boughs, he found a small half-dead branch and leaned his weight against it until it broke off in his hand with a crack that echoed through the forest. Stanton drew up, his gaze darting first one way, then the other. It's him! He held the flintlock close, one finger curled around the trigger. Sebastian doubted Stanton had taken the time to reload, but it was a double-barrel pistol, which meant he still had one shot left. Where did that come from? Sebastian knew a grim kind of amusement. The Baron's combination of arrogance and incompetence might have been comical, except there was nothing funny about a man who could kill and eat a young boy, or whose attempt to cover up his ugly past had already caused the death of his own child. Balancing carefully on his limb, Sebastian opened his hand and let the branch fall. It hit the rocks below with a clatter. There! The man named Burke swung around. He's over there! Like hounds following the scent of a fox, the two men swept across the hillside, their gazes hard on the undergrowth of hawthorn and holly. They never thought to look up. I don't see him. Burke paused almost directly beneath Sebastian, his gaze searching the rainy hillside. Where is he? My shot clipped him. Stanton crouched down to touch the leaf litter beneath the tree with one splayed hand. Look, there's blood. He must be... Slipping the handle of his knife between his clenched teeth, Sebastian gripped the rock with both hands and dropped straight down on the henchman, his full weight smashing the rock onto the man's head. The man collapsed beneath him, then lay utterly still. Stanton backed away, the pistol clutched in a two-handed grip, his mouth going slack with shock. My God! You smashed his head in. Wordlessly, Sebastian slipped the knife from his teeth and held it loosely in his right hand. Stanton extended the pistol, his elbows locked, but he was shaking so badly the gun barrel waved wildly. Stay back! I'll shoot! You know I will! Sebastian's lips pulled into a tight smile. 
You have only one shot left. What if you miss? The Baron's throat worked as he swallowed hard. The finger on the trigger twitched. Sebastian flipped the knife so that he held the blade between his thumb and forefinger, his gaze on the other man's eyes. He thought for a moment Stanton meant to put the pistol up. Then a wild kind of determination flared in the man's eyes. Sebastian sent the knife whistling through the air just as Stanton squeezed the trigger. The shot went wide, but Sebastian's blade caught the big man in the throat. Blood spurted from the wound, spilled from both corners of his open mouth in dark rivulets. His legs buckled beneath him, his eyes rolling back in his head. Sebastian surged to his feet. He could feel the sleeve of his coat wet and heavy against his arm and realized suddenly it wasn't just wet from the rain. He was losing more blood than he'd first realized. Staggering slightly, he walked to where Stanton lay. Blood still pulsed from the man's throat but it was slowing. Reaching down, Sebastian loosed the Baron's grip on the pistol and thrust it into the waistband of his own breeches. The gun was empty now, and a thorough search of Stanton's coat failed to turn up the powder and shot required to reload. But there were times when even an empty pistol had its uses. He searched both men for his own small flintlock as well, but didn't find it. Gritting his teeth, Sebastian retrieved his knife. He might need it again. Leaning against the tree trunk, he yanked off his cravat and used it to bind up his arm as best he could. He stayed for a moment, trying to calm his roiling stomach and clear his head. Then he headed up the hill toward his black mare, and the young blonde man Stanton had called Horn. Horn stood beside the horses, his head jerking this way and that as he searched the surrounding wood with wide, anxious eyes. Hunkering low, Sebastian crept up behind him, his knife in one hand, Stanton's flintlock pistol in the other. The pistol was empty, of course, but Sebastian was betting on the hireling being too scared to realize that. Treading softly in the wet, leafy humus, Sebastian pressed the barrel of the pistol behind Horn's ear. Move, and I'll blow your brains out. The youth froze. Sebastian clicked back the hammer for dramatic effect. This is your lucky day, my friend. You get to live. Jesus Christ, don't kill me. The man's voice broke off in a whimper as Sebastian brought the pistol's handle down like a club on the back of his pale blonde head. Yanking off Horn's dark neckcloth, Sebastian used it to quickly bind the unconscious youth's hands, just in case. A quick search of Horn's pockets again failed to yield Sebastian's flintlock, and he realized it must have been lost on the road when the Arab fell. Pushing to his feet, his head swimming sickeningly, Sebastian turned toward the horses. The horses snorted with fear, smelling blood. He reached for the Arab's reins, and she tossed her head, her eyes wide. Easy, girl, he crooned. Easy. Hauling himself into the saddle, he started to turn toward the road. Then he hesitated, his gaze lingering on the clearing. Beyond the silent heap of the young blond man, Horn, Sebastian could see the bloodied body of the first man he'd killed. The bodies of the other two, Lord Stanton and his hireling, Burke, lay someplace out of sight farther down the hill. It occurred to Sebastian, with a strange sense of detachment, that he'd just killed three men. Yet when he searched inside himself for some flicker of remorse, all he felt was a strange, detached kind of numbness. He knew the men he'd killed had been trying to kill him, but he wasn't sure that should matter. Wiping his sleeve across his wet face, he turned the Arab's head toward the road and spurred her forward, toward Avery. Chapter 62 The mare was tiring by the time the river came into view its storm-churned surface as agitated and grey as the sky above it. Mud flying from his horse's hooves, Sebastian tore up the hill to the wide green where the ancient Norman bulk of St. Andrew's brooded over a deserted, rain-drenched graveyard. He leapt down, his boots squelching in the mud, his gaze scanning the quiet scene. He'd been hoping to find Lovejoy and his constables already here, ahead of him. 
A half-grown lad hurrying past on his way to the high street cast Sebastian a queer look. You, lad, said Sebastian. Has there been a magistrate here from London? No. The boy backed away, his eyes wide as he stared at Sebastian's blood-splattered silk waistcoat, his torn and bloodied coat. Sebastian fumbled for his purse. Here's a shilling for you, if you'll walk the mare up and down the lane, and a promise of two more when I come back. The boy looked hesitant, but relented at the sight of the coins in Sebastian's hand. Sebastian splashed up the walk to the physician's white frame house. He plied the front door knocker hard, then listened to the sound of it echo away to nothing. Anyone there? he shouted against the roar of the rain. The house before him lay still and silent. He took a step back, his gaze scanning the yard. Water gushed off the eaves. He could see a stable with room for two horses at the base of the garden, and beside it an open-sided shelter where the physician doubtless kept his carriage. The space was empty. The sprigs of hay found on the bodies of young Stanton and Carmichael suggested they'd been held and killed in a barn or a stable. Yet surely Newman hadn't brought his victims here to Avery, where the chances of accidental discovery loomed large. So if not here, then where? Hello? Sebastian called again. He was about to swing away when he heard the latch turn. The door opened a crack, and the housekeeper peered out at him, her features pinched with suspicion and anxiety. He was acutely conscious of his beard-roughened chin, his disheveled clothes. Then she must have recognized him, because her expression cleared. Goodness, that's you, my lord. Whatever has happened to you, do come in and sit down quickly. Sebastian stayed on the porch. Where is Dr. Newman? I'm afraid the doctor is not in, my lord. She spoke with a studied deliberation that made Sebastian want to grab and shake her just to get her to speak faster. Went off last night, he did, in his gig. Told me not to expect him back before Monday. Have you any idea where he might have gone? The housekeeper frowned. I'm afraid he didn't say. She hesitated, then added slowly, I know he sometimes goes to Oak Hollow Farm for a few days, so I suppose it's possible he... Oak Hollow Farm, said Sebastian sharply. It's a property he inherited from his uncle. It did have tenants, but they emigrated to America last year, so it's empty now. He's been spending quite a bit of time there these last few months. Actually, I believe he was there just last. How do I get there? The question seemed to surprise her, but after a moment she stepped out onto the small portico to point into the driving rain. You take that lane just to the north of the church. Keep going past the village of Ditton until you see the ruins of an old medieval tower. The farm's there, just below the ridge. Thank you. Sebastian stepped back into the rain. There'll be a magistrate and constables here soon from London. Give them the information you've just given me. A London magistrate? The housekeeper clucked her tongue. Whatever for? But Sebastian was already running toward his horse. Chapter 63 Crumbling and open to the sky, the medieval watchtower stood on a rocky ridge overgrown with brambles and hawthorn. Sebastian paused beside the broken entrance, now a gaping hole that showed only a tumble of weed-choked fallen stones within. The rain had slowed to a steady drizzle. The wind, a lonesome thing that whistled through the old arrow slits and ruffled the Arab's wet mane. The air was filled with mist and the smell of wet leaves and grass, and a faint hint of wood smoke that drifted up from below. But the tower was long deserted the ancient stone walls blackened by the fires of centuries of vagrants who'd found shelter there. Sebastian nudged the mare forward to the edge of the ridge. Oak Hollow Farm lay just beyond the tower, in a shallow depression below the cusp of the hill overlooking the distant downs. A single line of smoke drifted up from a chimney at the far end of the farmhouse. The house was a low, rambling structure, built of coarse, rough stone with mullioned windows and a thatched roof. 
Once the farm must have been prosperous, but signs of recent neglect lay everywhere. In the cottage garden of roses and lavender and marigolds left to run rampant, in the broken hinge of the woodhouse door that creaked slowly in the wind. Beyond the house, the farm's cluster of stone outbuildings and wooden pens stood empty and silent beneath the grey sky. Rather than come at the farm directly from the open road, Sebastian cut through the copse of mingled chestnuts and oaks below the ridge. A few hundred yards uphill from the house, he dismounted, staggering slightly as an unexpected wave of light-headedness washed over him. Gritting his teeth, he looped his horse's reins around a low branch and continued on foot. At the edge of the wood, he paused, watching for any movement, any sign of life beyond that pale line of drifting smoke. Nothing. He knew he was making a dangerous assumption that Newman was in the room with a smoking chimney, but he tried not to think about that as he darted across the open field and ducked around the side of the house. Pressing his back against the wall, he paused for a moment and waited for his head to clear. Then he edged around until he was close enough to peer through the room's heavy, leaded glass window. He found himself looking at a kitchen, a big farm kitchen, with a wide-mouthed, smoke-darkened stone half that stretched across most of the far wall with a clutch of dusty pots that dangled from a blackened beam. At the battered, scrubbed table in the centre of the room sat Dr. Aaron Newman, his back to the window. As Sebastian watched, the doctor wrapped his fist around the neck of a brandy bottle and raised it to his lips to drink deeply. A well-kept fowling piece, an over- and under flintlock shotgun with a brass butt cap and steel trigger guard, lay on the table just inches from his hand. Anthony Atkinson was nowhere in sight. Sebastian blew out a long, slow breath. The boy could be anywhere in the house or outbuildings, or he could be dead. But Sebastian had come to the conclusion there was a good chance the child still lived. Newman had planned each of his murders with a chilling degree of precision and ruthlessness. The man might be a physician, rather than a surgeon, but he would still be familiar with the effects of time on a corpse. And anyone intending to drag a dead body into London in the dead of the night would want to avoid dealing with a cadaver in the full grip of rigor mortis. With effort, Sebastian checked his first impulse, which was to burst into the kitchen and end it all right here, right now. Against that shotgun, he had only the knife in his boot. And while ordinarily that would have been enough, Sebastian knew he would be taking a terrible chance now. His left arm hung nearly useless at his side, and he was dangerously light-headed, whether from loss of blood or concussion he had no way of knowing. Better to get the boy away by stealth, quickly and quietly. He could deal with Aaron Newman later. Turning away from the window, Sebastian flattened his back against the house wall, the stones cold and sharp against his palms. His gaze swept the kitchen yard with its woodhouse and smokehouse, and moved on to the buildings clustered around the farmyard, the henhouse and pigsty, wagon sheds and stables, barn and calf pens. All appeared empty, the old manure heap in the centre of the yard now blackened with age and rain. Neither the doctor's gig nor his horse was anywhere to be seen. Sebastian brought his gaze back to the stable. Constructed of the same coarse, rough stones as the other farm buildings, it had a thatched, hipped roof with a central gable for the hayloft, and a wide set of double doors that doubtless gave access to a carriage room. The carriage doors were closed, but Sebastian could see freshly churned mud in the yard before them. Sucking in a deep breath tinged with wood smoke and the smell of damp stone, he eased away from the window and worked his way back toward the corner of the house. Wary of being seen, if Newman should chance to stand and glance out the window, Sebastian approached the farmyard by swinging out in a wide arc his boots squelching in the mud as he neared the abandoned pigsty. It was raining harder now, big drops that pattered on the thatched roofs and ran down the back of Sebastian's collar as he sprinted across the farm road to the carriage doors. The doors were old and warped, and slid apart with a harsh grating that was lost in the sound of trees bending in the wind and rain, 
slapping into mud. Squeezing through the narrow opening, Sebastian quickly eased the door shut behind him. He found himself in a space some twenty feet deep and twelve feet wide. The air here was thick with the smell of dust and hay and fresh manure. A black gig, its padded leather seat still wet with that morning's rain, stood in the dim light. Halfway down the wall to his right, an arched opening framed with dressed stone gave access to a darkened corridor. Skirting the gig, Sebastian ducked through the arch to find himself in a cobbled passage. Beyond a narrow flight of stairs leading up to the hayloft stretched a row of three horse stalls with a harness room and feed bin ranged along the opposite side of the passage. A Dutch door at the far end of the passage doubtless led to a fenced side yard. Antony, Sebastian called, the clatter of his boot heels on the cobbled floor echoing in the stillness. A big bay tethered in the first stall lifted its head, its ears flicking forward as it whinnied loudly. From the copse up the hill came a distant answering nicker. Bloody hell, whispered Sebastian, slipping the knife from his boot. If Newman heard the horses and decided to investigate... Sebastian moved quickly down the passage. The second stall stood empty in the dull light cast by its high cobwebbed window. Outside he could hear the rain pick up again, beating harder on the thatched roof overhead. His stomach clenching with the knowledge of what he might find, Sebastian moved on to the last stall. The boy lay curled up against the thick planked walls of the third stall, his hands and feet bound, a gag prying his mouth open in an awkward rictus. His eyes were closed, his face pale and streaked with dirt and the tracks of dried tears. But Sebastian could see the shudder of his stained white nightshirt where it stretched across his chest. Antony? Sebastian hunkered down to touch the boy's shoulder. I'm here to take you home. Everything's going to be all right. The boy's eyes fluttered open, then closed again, his breath coming slow and shallow. Newman had obviously dosed the boy liberally with laudanum. Don't be afraid of the knife. I'm going to use it to cut you loose. His hands sweaty on the handle of the blade, Sebastian sliced through the ropes at the boy's hands and feet, then loosed the gag at his mouth. You need to wake up for me, Antony. He grasped the boy's shoulders to give him a little shake. Can you stand? Antony's eyelids opened again, his eyes glassy, his head rolling on his neck. Come on, men. Slipping his hands beneath the boy's armpits, Sebastian hauled him upright, staggering slightly as he took the boy's weight. For one perilous moment, the barn's dusty light dimmed, and Sebastian's head swam. I don't think I can carry you, lad. Sebastian wrapped an arm around the boy's waist. You've got to at least hold on and try to walk. Can you do that? Antony's lips parted, his thin chest shuddering as he sucked in a deep breath and nodded. Good lad. Sebastian lurched toward the passage. He wasn't sure if he was holding the boy up or if it was the other way around. The rain pounded on the roof, pattered against the high windows. He was concentrating so hard on putting one foot in front of the other that it wasn't till they reached the arched entrance to the carriage room that Sebastian heard the slap of boots in the mud outside and the rasp of the carriage doors opening. Chapter 64 Sebastian shoved the boy behind him. The door at the other end of the passage, he whispered. Get yourself out of here, then run like hell for the wood. As long as Sebastian could keep Newman at the entrance to the carriage room, the shadowy recesses of the passage would be out of his line of vision. Aaron Newman loomed in the open carriage doors, a lean figure silhouetted against the rain-filled yard. Stay right there and put your hands where I can see them, said the doctor, the fouling piece gripped in both hands. Do it, my lord, or I swear to God I'll shoot you. Sebastian braced his hands against the stone doorframe beside him and said, It's over, Dr. Newman. The doctor's hands tightened on the shotgun's ornate stock. I beg to differ with you, my lord, but I don't see it that way. Sebastian was aware of the boy's frightened breathing behind him. 
the furtive patter of bare feet on the cobbled floor as Antony crept toward the far end of the passage. Sebastian managed to keep his voice calm, although he could feel his pulse racing in his neck. I didn't come alone. Sir Henry Lovejoy and some half a dozen of his constables are on their way here. Newman raised one eyebrow. You came ahead, did you? How foolhardy of you. By now, Antony had reached the far end of the passage. I know about your son, said Sebastian, scuffing one boot heel across the cobbles to cover the scrape made by the door's bolt being drawn back. I know what they did to him on the Harmony. I understand your anger and your desire for justice. But why not kill the men responsible for what happened to him? Why murder their innocent children? Newman shook his head, a muscle jumping along his tightened jaw. Death ends all suffering. I wanted them to pay for what they did to Gideon. And for what they did to me. I wanted them to feel what I have felt, to suffer what I have suffered. They killed my son. I killed theirs. Edward Bellamy didn't kill your son. He didn't protect him either. My son was entrusted to his care. Bellamy was captain of that ship. If anyone had the power to stop what happened, it was him. Sebastian felt the brush of cool air from the door easing open at his back heard the slow creak of a hinge as Antony Atkinson moved oh so carefully. Yet you killed the Reverend Thornton's son first. Why? Thornton was a man of God. A man of God! He urged them to kill my son. Urged them. Mary Thornton told me about it when she was dying. About how the good Reverend reassured the others that God would forgive them. Well, he was wrong, wasn't he? Did you kill her? Mary Thornton, I mean. Newman shook his head. God killed her. Sebastian was watching the man's wild grey eyes. And so he knew the instant the doctor heard the bang of the Dutch door flying fully open, the distant slap of running feet hitting the muddy yard. His lips peeled away from his teeth in a painful grimace. You bastard! Sebastian jerked back just as Newman tightened his finger on the shotgun's trigger and fired. The first barrel discharged in a deafening blast of fiery powder and shot that sent bits of stone coping and wooden splinters from the stairs flying. The air filled with thick smoke and the stench of cordite. Sebastian took one step toward the open door at the end of the cobbled aisle, then knew it for a mistake. Newman still had another barrel. Silhouetted against the open doorway, Sebastian would be impossible to miss. He dove instead into the first stall, his injured shoulder exploding in fire as he careened into the plank wall and slipped to his knees. The carriage horse whinnied in alarm, its head tossing, its hoofs clattering on the straw-covered cobbles. Sebastian rolled quickly to his feet, his head spinning as he drew back into the shadows. He could feel the drops of mingled sweat and rainwater dripping from his hair to roll down his cheeks. Hear the doctor's boots in the cobbled passage. Slipping his knife from his boot, Sebastian reached out and unhooked the bay's tether. He held the length of leather clutched in his fist, the edges of the stiff hide digging into his palm as he waited for Newman to come into view. He watched the doctor pass the stall, his gaze fixed on the open doorway at the end of the passage. The bay snorted and tossed its head just as Sebastian let the tether drop. The sound of the leather slapping against the stall's heel post brought Newman's head around, his eyes wide. Sebastian pricked the bay's flanks and sent it charging out of the stall. Newman took a quick step back, his finger tightening on the trigger in a reflex action. The fouling piece exploded in a deafening concussion that filled the stables with flames and smoke. Shot ripped through the nearest heel post, torn shards of wood and splinters flying through the air as Sebastian dove into him. The force of the impact sent Newman crashing back against the harness room wall. Their feet tangled, Newman going down to smack his back hard against the cobbled floor. Sebastian slammed on top of him, the knife blade held tight against the doctor's throat. In the sudden stillness, his ears still ringing from the shot, Sebastian could hear the sawing of his own breath and the roar of the rain through the open doors. And something else. The distant thunder of approaching horses ridden fast. 
Newman's lips parted, his chest shuddering as he sought to draw air into his aching lungs. Kill me, he said in a hoarse whisper. Why don't you just kill me? Sebastian shook his head. He thought about Francesca Bellamy, about Lady Carmichael, about Dominic Stanton's mother, now half mad with her grief. And he felt a rush of fury that submerged all shreds of pity or understanding. No. You said it yourself. Death ends all suffering. And you deserve to suffer. For what you did to those innocent young men, and for what their deaths have done to those who loved them. They heard a shout from the yard, and a boy's thin voice saying, In the stables. They're in the stables. Newman's eyes squeezed shut, his breathing still ragged. I did it for Gideon. I was never able to do anything for him in life. The least I could do was avenge his death. No. Sebastian closed his fist on the doctor's coat and hauled him to his feet. You did it for yourself. Chapter 65 Sir Henry Lovejoy hunched his shoulders against the rain as he watched his constables bundle the Kentish doctor out of the stables. I thought this wasn't your case, said Devlin, coming up beside him. It's not, said Henry, swinging his head to look at the Viscount. He stood hatless in the rain, his once fine coat, waistcoat and breeches torn and smeared with mud and blood and bits of leaves and straw. Good God, we need to get you to a surgeon. It'll keep. Devlin scrubbed a hand across his face, wiping the rain from his eyes. How's the boy? He's a good lad. He'll be all right. Thanks to the laudanum, I don't think he remembers much. But I've no doubt his testimony, combined with whatever evidence a search of the farm buildings yields, will be more than enough to see the good doctor hang. Devlin's features remained impassive as he stared off across the mist-filled valley. Uh, there are some bodies in the wood just past the second toll gate out of London. You might want to send a couple of your men to deal with them. Bodies? Lord Stanton and several of his henchmen. They tried to kill me. That's how you killed them. I was in a hurry. Henry sighed. Sir Henry? Henry turned to see Constable Higgins coming towards them across the yard, his plump cheeks red with exertion, something small and white clutched in one fist. Constable, I thought you'd want to see this, said Higgins, holding out a small porcelain figurine. We found it in a bag under the seat of Newman's gig. What is it? said Henry. The Viscount reached to take the delicate statue in his hands. A mermaid. It's a mermaid. Henry groped for his handkerchief. Merciful heavens. What will happen to them? Devlin asked, staring down at the figurine. I mean Atkinson and Carmichael and the absent Mr. and Mrs. Dunlop. Nothing, I suspect. I've never known the Crown to prosecute cases of cannibalism on the high seas. Actually, I was thinking about what they did to David Jarvis. Henry shrugged. We've no way of knowing who struck the fatal blow. The crew was hanged for his death. The crew was hanged for mutiny. Devlin's lips flattened into a sardonic smile. Of course. Henry knew a profound inner sense of uneasiness. You're planning something. What is it? A gleam of amusement touched the Viscount's haunted yellow eyes. I don't think you want to know. I think I've patched you up more in the past nine months than I did during the war said Paul Gibson, wrapping a length of bandage around Sebastian's upper arm. Here, put your finger on that. They were in Sebastian's library, with Sebastian seated, shirtless, on the edge of his desk. He smiled and held the end of the bandage in place, while the doctor rummaged in his bag for a pair of scissors. What is war, after all, but an organized, sanctioned form of mass murder? Gibson cut the length of gauze and tied it off, his attention seemingly all for his work. 
I don't suppose you've heard the latest rumours. What rumours? About Russell Yates and Kat Bullin. They've been married by special licence. What? Gibson pushed out his breath in a sigh. I was afraid you didn't know anything about it. No, said Sebastian. I didn't. He fixed his gaze unseeingly on the bowl of bloody water beside them, while his friend went to work on the knife cuts on Sebastian's wrists. Ever since he'd turned Aaron Newman over to Sir Henry down at Oak Hollow Farm, Sebastian had been trying to figure out how, with marriage out of the question, he was going to keep Cat safe from Jarvis. But it seemed Cat had found a way to protect herself. Now, freed from the desperate rush to catch a killer and devise some way to shield Cat from Jarvis's malevolence, Sebastian suddenly found himself with nothing to distract him from the brutal reality of a future without Cat as his love. Without Cat in his life. He felt a hideous emptiness yawn deep within his being, and for one blinding moment the agony of it was so raw that it took his breath. Sebastian! Gibson broke off as the sound of running feet and the bang of a distant door foretold the arrival of Tom. I've found one, said Tom, his breath coming fast and his cheeks flushed. I've found you a valet. He's been a gentleman's gentleman for more than twenty years. He knows all about your interest in murder and the rigs from Rosemary Lane you sometimes wear. And he don't bother him a bit. In fact, he'll be a right handy one to have around next time we find ourselves with a murder to investigate, cause he knows near every rookery and cracksman and blacklegs in town. Sebastian slid off the edge of the desk. And how precisely does he come to have this information? His ma owns the Blue Anchor. She what? The Blue Anchor was the most notorious flash house in town, frequented by the worst sort of Morocco men, dashers and bow traps. Tom swallowed. I know what you're thinking, but you got it wrong. Calhoun's ma was determined her son weren't going to grow up to be no receiver or fancy man, and he hasn't. Tom hesitated, except for one brief spell he did in Newgate, and that weren't his fault. Gibson choked and turned away to hide his amusement. What did you say this paragon's name is? asked Sebastian. Jules Calhoun. He says he can come around tomorrow evening for an interview. If you're interested. Tom cast a worried glance at Gibson, who was now openly laughing. Are you interested? After weeks of making do with a footman, of course I'm interested. Sebastian pointed a warning finger at his tiger. But if so much as a shoestring goes missing in this house, it'll be on your account. Tom's face cleared. He's a right one. You'll see. Tom dashed off while Gibson set about collecting his various implements and returning them to his bag. After a moment, he said, Have you seen her yet? There was no need to identify which her he referred to. Cat's name hovered between them still. Sebastian crossed the room to splash brandy into two glasses. No, not yet. Gibson looked up from his task. You're going to have to find some way to put it all behind you, Sebastian. Cat. The war. The things you saw. The things you did. This desperate, futile quest to find your mother. Again, the words hung in the air, unsaid, but there. Sebastian came to hand his friend his drink. And have you put it all behind you then, Paul? The war. The loss of your leg. The hunger for the sweet relief to be found in an elixir of poppies. The skin beside Gibson's eyes crinkled in amusement as he raised his brandy in a silent toast. No, but we doctors are always better at giving advice than taking it. Chapter 66 Monday, 23rd of September, 1811 Cat was in her dressing room supervising the packing of her trunks when she looked up to find Devlin standing in the doorway. 
I'd heard you were hurt, she said, a worried gaze tracing the cuts and purple bruises that discoloured his face, the arm that hung stiff and awkward in a sling at his side. It's nothing. He turned his head to survey the litter of half-packed trunks and tumbled gowns strewn about the room. It's true, then, what they are saying. You have wed. She nodded, barely trusting herself to speak. Yes. He studied her face. Why Yates? He can protect me. He has evidence that would destroy Jarvis were it to be made public. But, Cat, what kind of a marriage can this be with a man who— He left the rest of the sentence unsaid. Her voice shook as she answered him. The only kind I want? She cleared her throat, trying to ease the tight constriction that felt as if it might choke her. I have let it be known that the Post scrambled the announcement of my coming marriage. There will doubtless be some talk, but it should die down. He shrugged one shoulder, but said nothing. She knew it meant nothing to him, the public whispers and speculations. The old urge to go to him was still there. The urge to take him in her arms and enfold him in the comfort of her embrace. The strength of that wanting, despite all she knew, despite the shame now attached to what they had been to each other, shocked and appalled her. She gripped her hands together against her skirt. Have you spoken to Hendon? His face was oddly blank, as if carefully drained of all emotion. I've nothing more to say to him. It's not his fault what happened between us. God knows he tried to discourage it. He took your mother as his mistress. And you took me as yours. I would have made you my wife. Yes. Well, at least we were spared that. He searched her face, his yellow eyes hard, questioning. What about you? Do you forgive him? Cat let out a sigh that shuddered her breasts. For my mother's sake? No. He would have taken her child away from her. Yet he wanted what was best for me, didn't he? Or what was best for himself? Does he plan to acknowledge you? She felt a wry smile tug at one corner of her lips. That's asking a bit much, isn't it? For the Earl of Hendon to acknowledge an actress as his daughter? An actress who everyone knows was mistress to his son? Cat. He reached as if to touch her, but she jerked away. No. You mustn't. She watched his hand fall back to his side. She found she was no longer able to fathom his thoughts, the exact tenor of his emotions. She knew Devlin better than she'd ever known anyone in her life. But she knew him as a lover. How was she ever to learn to know him as a brother? I look at you, he said, his voice a torn whisper. I look at you, and I see my father's eyes staring back at me. And still in my heart I can't accept it. Surely, if you were my sister, I would know it. They studied each other across the crackling distance that separated them. She said, how could we ever have imagined such a thing? He shook his head. I am trying, but I don't know how to make my love simply go away. She saw the pain in his eyes and knew there was nothing she could say, nothing she could do to ease it. She wanted to say, I love you. I will always love you. Instead, she said, We must. The Earl of Hendon found his first-born child, Amanda, seated at her embroidery frame in the morning room. I've come to tell you I have another daughter, he said, standing in the centre of the rug as she continued to set neat stitches in the chair cover she was making. An illegitimate daughter. Amanda let out a peal of laughter, her needle flashing in and out. Good God, are you getting soft in your old age? What precious little thing has managed to convince you she's your long-lost offspring? Cat Berlin. All trace of amusement fled her face. 
She set the embroidery frame aside. You can't be serious. But I am. Amanda raised one eyebrow. How clever of you. So that's why the marriage has been called off. However did you manage to convince her? Hendon worked his jaw back and forth. What do you think? That I contrived this tale to drive a wedge between her and Devlin? I'm not that clever. She is my daughter. Of that there is no doubt. He watched a slow, unpleasant smile spread across Amanda's face. So now they believe they've been committing incest all these years. And of course, you said not a word to disabuse them of that notion. Hendon tightened his jaw. He'll discover the truth, you know, some day. And when he does, this will be just one more lie you've told him. One more lie he'll never forgive you for. Hendon let his gaze rove over her haughty face with its unsuccessful blending of his own blunt features with the fine-boned beauty of her mother. He wanted to deny it. Instead, he turned and left her there with her embroidery hoop beside the cold hearth. He had almost reached the doorway when he heard her start to laugh. He kept walking. Charles, Lord Jarvis, stood beside the library windows overlooking the rear garden of his house in Berkeley Square. He was calm. Rage made men do stupid things, and Jarvis was never stupid. He had suffered a setback, several setbacks, and he had some scores to settle. But he was in no hurry, and he was already beginning to see a way the situation might be turned to his advantage. His butler scratched discreetly at the door. Lord Devlin to see you, my lord. Jarvis kept his back to the room, his gaze on the garden below. I'm not at home. Yes, my l I suspected you might deny me, said the Viscount in a bland voice. So I've come anyway. Jarvis's head snapped around, his eyes narrowing. The Viscount had his left arm in a sling and a patch of sticking plaster on his forehead. Jarvis grunted. Who did the damage? Lord Stanton or this Kentish doctor I've been hearing about. Both. Jarvis reached for his snuffbox. Say what you have to say and then get out of my house. Devlin smiled. He carried a leather book tucked under one arm, a large volume with a charred binding that he set on the corner of Jarvis's desk. I brought you this. Jarvis frowned. What is it? The Harmony's Log. I think you'll find it makes interesting reading. Jarvis stayed where he was. Devlin turned toward the door, but paused with one hand on the knob to look back and say, I'd like to have known your son. You have much to be proud of. Good day, my lord. When Devlin had gone, Jarvis stared at the charred log on his desk. It was a moment before he crossed the room to pick it up. He read the log, seated in the embrasure beside the window. It was some time before he finished, closing the log with a quiet snap. The sun had sunk low behind the neighboring rooftops, lengthening the shadows in the library. And still he sat there, until the last of the day faded from the sky and the lamplighter on his rounds set a flickering flame to the oil lamps in the square. The End This is Davina Porter. We hope you have enjoyed this production of Why Mermaids Sing, a Sebastian Sincere Mystery by C.S. Harris. Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So look for us at your public library or on download sites online. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. The Bastion Sincere Mystery by C.S. Harris Recorded Books offers a wide selection of bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and...